15 will call the meeting in order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's customary, we'll observe a moment of silence. I'd like to announce this meeting is being recorded and televised by WHCA and seek a motion for approval of bill and payroll warrants. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Let's seek a motion to accept correspondence in the read file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Public forum, if anyone would like to speak about anything that is not on the agenda. If I may, Chairman. Um, I'm on, on uh, the DPW Building Committee and um, the Chairman of the uh, DPW commissioners and our committee could not be here tonight, but he asked me if I can make an announcement that on April 1st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. there'll be an open house at our DPW where there'll be town employees there to uh, walk anybody who wants to see exactly what our DPW is like now and why it needs to be repaired and what, what they're looking for. And there may be, they're looking to possibly uh, have the guys join together and uh, give some donations or have maybe a box of coffee or something like that, you know, and uh, just have, invite people to come in and look at it. So just put that on your calendar. Uh, it's Saturday, April 1st uh, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And I believe they may do a second one on the 15th. There is a uh, an item on um, Whitman Pride that I posted about those situations about having uh, the two meetings. So if you want to go on there and, and just mark it down to the fact that, yes, uh, you'd like to attend and see exactly why uh, we need a new, D D new DPW and what kind of shape it's in. I believe the building was built in, I thought, the pre-40s, but if I looked in the article that's on there and it's built like 1900-something, you know, 03, 04, I mean, it's the original building, that front building. And it's, uh, I think it's time, <laughs> my opinion. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And seek a motion for approval of meeting minutes. Open session, March 7, 2023. So moved. Second. All in favor? Second. Yeah, let's see. Okay, scheduled this evening, we have a joint meeting with the Finance Committee to discuss fiscal year 24 budget. Um, just a couple things before the meeting starts. Um, I know some department heads have reached out and had some presentations or discussion they wanted to make in front of both committees, so we'll allow that after. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, Robert's rules will be in effect. I'd ask you not to speak unless acknowledged by the chair. Uh, everyone who wants to speak will be given an opportunity. We're just not going to talk over anyone, and we're going to be respectful of it. any opinions, whether you may agree with them or not. So to open the meeting, I'll toss it to you, and then uh, the town administrator, Rick. Yes. We'll go to you first, Rick, and then we'll go to the town administrator, and we'll start there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I just want to start off by saying uh, I think we're in a better place uh, than we were last year, collaboratively, with this budget cycle. I think we've had an, an, an opportunity to meet with departments. We're not, we haven't completed all the meetings uh, as of yet, um, but as you recall from our first joint meeting, um, we talked about the Finance Committee's collective concern about the, the budgets that were being submitted. Um, the concern for a sustainable budget. I think, you know, we talked that, about it quite extensively. Um, and although we haven't had a lot of time to digest the, uh, the new uh, Article 2 and the warrant that was provided to us uh, by the town administrator, um, I, can, I can just want to take this opportunity to recognize the budget subcommittee for the work that they did. And, and I don't want to miss this opportunity to segue between um, the submitted budgets by the town departments and uh, the evaluation um, and, you know, the department had meetings, but then the ongoing meetings with the budget subcommittee, uh, I was able to, in the short amount of time that I was provided a copy of the worksheet that they, they did, um, that they did a lot of work. Um, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to, you know, to separate the, the wants and the needs, but I, I really think they did an exemplary job taking the budget submissions that were provided by the town departments and coming up with 
some middle ground. There's still a lot of work to do. I had the opportunity to meet with our uh, town administrator today just to say that, um, I, in my opinion, it would be nice to hear from the budget subcommittee before we move on to the town administrator and eventually the selectmen's balanced budget for consideration for the recommendations of this committee. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say for our opening statement, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So what I will say is, yet this committee created a budget subcommittee, and I think that was, I don't think any <coughs> intention that that subcommittee was going to draft the, the town's budget. Th that falls on our financial team with uh, Ken Lytell, Mary Beth, Frank. Uh, I, I think that was designed to help develop a budget, uh, help uh, clarify points that, that may have need to be clarified, but I, as far as that subcommittee, I don't think they were ever tasked with that they were going to be the ones to create our town budget, because that's simply just not the way it is. Um, I think that budget that you've all received uh, shows some pretty key points that due diligence has been done, that budgets have been scraped to try and make this within our levy. Um, I'll toss it to Mary Beth to, obviously, you, you know more about the document and can if you mm -hmm. wanted to speak on it. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, this is a budget created by a professional financial team. And, and I think, you no, know, we'll see momentarily if the, how the board feels about it. And, Okay, so yes, a lot of this, you know, had been started with uh, Frank and Ken, and um, I went over all the numbers. The three of us worked on this all last week, um, and we, with a 5% assessment increase on the town's assessment uh, from the schools, that's the number that we had plugged in, uh, we were not um, close to a balanced budget. So I went line by line with Ken and Frank and cut everywhere that we could possibly cut without hurting the departments. Um, this does have um, increases for salaries where most of the unions are receiving a 2.5%. This does have um, the same for the department heads except for those that have contracts. If they have contracts for 2%, and they're in here for 2%. Um, we used the free cash that we had available uh, for the articles, and um, we have a couple of items that were originally on the warrant that we removed that we're going to use ARPA funds for. We have used all of the free cash except $316.75 at this point. Um, we're, these are working documents, so I know um, that these will be adjusted here and there, but we do have to stay within the, the total amount um, that we have to work with. So um, I did um, speak with department heads, and you know, they understood not that they liked it, but the cuts that I made from their requests, Ken made, Frank made, that we all made uh, together to get us to a balanced budget. And this was very difficult um, to do that, and I know that a couple of departments have a couple of contractual things that we'll need to uh, tweak in this budget and increase a bit and then decrease somewhere else. But to me, this is an extremely lean budget, and that's at a 5% assessment. So if, you know, the schools put forth 8.35%, that's another, I believe, $560,351 that would need to be cut from this already lean budget. And if we do that, I feel that we're looking without a doubt at layoffs, police, fire, DPW, town hall. I just don't know where in this budget there is not an extra 560 plus thousand um, to skim off this. So um, I feel at this point it is balanced. Um, it's a, a good place. Like I said, we are going to have to still tweak it a little bit. Um, and we're still working on the articles that still have yet to be voted. But, any <clears throat> questions? Well, uh, and I think also that uh, the other key takeaway was uh, our, our revenue analysis, which I know 
the budget subcommittee is kind of keyed in on and, and been part of that, uh, where our estimates would be. So I don't think you see any fictitious numbers in, in our revenue uh, projections. I don't think, I think our revenue projections uh, have been pretty stable, uh, you know, except where we have had to, you know, try to push it a little bit more to accommodate everyone fairly. Um, like Mary Beth said, uh, tough decisions were made. And we always knew we were going to have to make those decisions. And I, I think if, if you look at this budget, it was, I think where you see growth, obviously, is contractual growth. Uh, but where we feel that there is weakness that n needs to be met. Uh, very much like uh, here at the school committee meetings, that they need things. Well, the town needs things too. That that's just the fact of it. And the revenue is the revenue. And I think that's a piece that has been sadly overlooked this year. Sadly. <coughs> Say something? Yes. All right. Um, if you remember a few years ago um, when Colin and I sat in in a meeting with all the department heads and for a couple of them, and how they cut their budgets to the extreme, it was almost dangerous what they cut out of their budgets, especially uh, where you have police, fire, you know, emergency uh, personnel. I don't ever want to see that happen again. I will not support a budget that the town has to cut so deeply that we lose people. It's not what we're here for. We're here to, we're here to give the taxpayers the best support, whether it's in it's town support, educational support, a safety that the town can afford. And there's no way while I support a budget where the department heads have to cut so that they will lose personnel. I mean, as it is right now, I imagine our fire department is, is, is overburdened for the fact that they have to run an ambulance to further hospitals away, whether, you know, it's Good Sam's or South Shore. Brockton's not there. Brockton was a quick run. Now, instead of having a, a, an hour and a half or a two-hour run, you get a four-hour run. You lose the ambulance for four hours because, you, you know, it's a longer run. Um, they're dealing with that. That's costing the town, but that, those are emergencies. <clears throat> There's no way I will support a budget where we have to cut our town personnel to support one major budget. That simple. That's all I have to say. Um, thank you. Um, just to clarify a little bit about the, the budget subcommittee or working group, what we were trying to do, I think, was not to make decision-making. We didn't have any decision-making authority about the budget, to be clear. What we wanted to do is to do a lot of the due diligence behind, like, the revenue and, and running scenarios so that you guys and the board could be more informed about the decisions that you make. You know, if we were willing to put in more time just so we could, like I said, look at our financial policy, run certain scenarios, look at our revenue, pass that over to, to the incoming town administrator so that in a relatively short amount of time she could make intelligent decisions about the budget. You know what I mean? So it wasn't the intention that the budget subcommittee would make those decisions, simply do a lot of the legwork so that we are sitting around the table have, are better informed about the decisions we make with the budget. Um, we do think about the 5% the versus the ask with the schools. It, it, is, it was a concern for me to be at the, to be at the meeting the other night. I do respect the people on the school committee, and I respect the superintendent, obviously. The, the administration, I, I think, they have really good intentions in mind. But admittedly, the school committee, um, one thing that I do disagree with is they're making decisions with the soul, solely through the, the lens of being an advocate for students, which is admirable, you know, to be an, to be an advocate for students. But I think the, the responsibility, at least that I feel, is 
is not just to be an advocate for the schools, but I have to balance that off with being an advocate for all departments. And when we're, when we're coming up with a budget, we have to think about how can we equitably fund the services that the town expect, not just one department. Um, and I think the vibe I got the other night was they were willing to, to come in high again and then go back and forth over the next couple of weeks. And it's the old game that maybe we played over the years that I'm hoping with time we can kind of move away from because it's clear that the, that the number that they submitted, given the current levy that we have, um, is, is not going to work. So it just puts us all in a difficult situation where now we're kind of pitted against each other. And that's, I think that's really unfortunate. I'm hoping that in the future, the more proactive we can be and the more legwork that we can do um, and be more intelligent about the budget cycles that are in front of us, we don't have to get to this place again, at least at this point in the budget season. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to say that um, I think the fact that we talk on a regular basis is helpful. And from my perspective as a finance committee member, um, as the initial requests came in, knowing that there was a 5% goal for the schools and a 2 to 2.5% 2 goal for the towns, different budgets came in to us that, just looking at my notes, were 13% increases, 12% increases. Um, 5% increases. So there were very few budgets from the town side that came in with the same guidelines that were being applied to the schools. And my position in terms of I definitely am an advocate for the school budget is they should come in with their high request just as the department heads for the police, the fire technology, library, council on aging came in with their wish list. And then we get to a point, I guess I have more sense of we have time to get this to done. We have time to get this done without sacrificing firefighters and librarians and police officers, or teachers for that matter, because teachers are town employees just as firefighters and, and the other town employees are. So I think that uh, a lot of work has been put in both by the budget subcommittee, I'd like to know, I think there's like three different budget subcommittees, but um, the budget subcommittee that, that Mary Beth worked on, but this one that you work on, Sean, and um, that we have plenty of time to get this to work. I don't think this has to be as adversarial as it had been starting to shape up, I think, as early as November, where the town was saying to the schools, we don't have the money to support your budget. And I didn't even know what the school's budget was. So um, I'm less anxious about the position that we're in now, because I do believe that although school committee members are advocates for the students, they're also town residents. And they don't, they don't live in a different planet from us. They live in this town, and they know that the quality of life in this town is dependent on all of the services, not just the schools. But if they don't advocate for the schools, who will? But I believe they will be ready to work with everybody to see that we come to the best possible scenario for the children, the other departments, and the taxpayers of the town. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Well, where, where I'm going <clears> to <throat> disagree with you is they are vastly different than a request from our department heads. They certify a budget. Mm -hmm. Our department heads simply make an ask as a presentation of where they're looking to go in the future. Forthright knowing that the person sitting to my right has the ability, and these people up here have the ability to tell our department heads, you will not get that this year. We do not have that same luxury with the school. So. I will be forthright that I was in shock when I watched the past two meetings and you got up and represented yourself as a FinCom member and said, stick to your guns in one meeting. Hold fast on the budget. Don't worry about the 5%. We're hearing fictitious numbers. Uh, We'll go through it with a fine-tooth comb, support a challenge, but probably support. How do you know you'll probably support? I asked the chairman of your committee when I walked in if you've even met with them yet. I recently have gone through some of your meetings, and I still and I have not heard a discussion where that has come up. So I, I think to stand up in that meeting and basically draw a line in the sand between departments, the town, and the school. I will say I was just in shock. So it's one thing to be an advocate on your own, but 
to stand up and represent yourself as a finance committee member from Whitman and say, hold your ground, stand fast, fictitious. I, I don't know what numbers were fictitious because you were holding what Mary Beth had sent them, which has not changed in over a month, our revenue projections. 5% has been in four years now. It's fiscal policy for the town, but it doesn't ever seem to get recognized by the school. The other thing I, I think we need to strongly look at, and I'm also very taken back that this is not coming up at a school committee level, is they're saying level, level service, level service plus. The moment you hit plus, it's no longer level service in my opinion. But what they're also not telling you is that there's close to $517,000 of one-time money they used that has now just been rolled over and absorbed into the budget. They have close to $840,000 of ESSER funds they're putting in next year's budget, but it was a brief, oh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. That's not fit financial planning. I've sat up here for six years now and said I would support any plan as long as it was a sustainable plan. But why don't we have that yet? So I can't commend the work the school's done because I've watched their five-year budget and their five-year plan change. But what is never taken into consideration is actual revenue. And we present it, and I keep on going back to fictitious as you held that paper up. These are fictitious numbers. There's nothing fictitious about it. We know our revenue. So how do we make it work? And that's what I'm hoping to get to tonight. I don't think we're spending like drunken sailors. Uh, you know, we're compensating, whether you look at an educator, a fireman, a policeman, we're fairly compensating our employees. And I think all of us have stood by that. These guys are a lot longer than the guys that to my left and myself. We've always thought about making sure our employees were compensated fairly to the market, and we are. And if you look at where, where we lie with employee salaries, we're not the highest, no, we're not the lowest. And I, and I think that stands for the school district. But it's the other spending we have to look at because the school seems to say, it's part of our educational plan. We should have it. Well, why and why aren't, isn't every other department afforded that luxury? So I think we need to come to some understanding tonight and hopefully some direction because we really don't have a lot of time. That warrant has to be posted by April 15th. 15 days before. So that gives the school two more, two more meetings. Rick, Rick and then Kathleen. Okay, I just want to just, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I just want to let uh, the board know that Kathleen is the liaison to the district, and, you know, sh as such, she presents her opinions as the liaison back to this committee. But this is still a nine-member committee. So I, I don't want you to take comments of the vice chair out of context with respect to the whole committee and the deliberation. Just and. Again, I just want to stress that we did meet with the district one time. We had the joint meeting with the boards of selectmen and the finance committees before the district earlier this year. And we do expect to meet with the superintendent next week. So I, I just want to say that we're still preliminarily uh, evaluating how the district's budget is going to dovetail with town departments and that we continue to work on a balanced budget. That's all. And just, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to respectfully respond to your statement in that the minute I said the word fictitious, I said that is not the word I meant to use. <laughs> I did mean preliminary because I do believe that the, so I don't disagree with the word fictitious being uh, something that shouldn't have been in the meeting. Uh, you know yourself, if you're not speaking from a script, the, a word comes, you say it, and it's like, darn, that is not what I meant to say. So I did mean preliminary. There's nothing fictitious about these numbers. We've been living with them every Tuesday night for the past three months. But I do believe some of these budget figures are preliminary, especially the, um, oh, the new growth and the question that I asked you, Mary Beth, about how do we make sure that we don't lose the excess levy capacity that as a town meeting, we unanimously supported capturing the excess levy capacity and then somehow <coughs> through the cracks. And I want to make sure that doesn't happen because we can't afford to let one penny of available tax revenue go 
to waste in a year that has, with every year, we're fighting for every tax dollar that we can get. So I, I respectfully, I accept your, your uh, criticism of my choice of words. I regretted it the minute it came out of my mouth. <clears throat> well, I think, we're, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just um, gonna say that this is now the sixth budget I've worked on. I think I took your seat on, on that committee uh, six years ago. Um, and this year, this, you know, uh, balanced budget with a little bit of free cash to, to, to make it work feels a lot more like, you know, fiscal 19 and fiscal 21 than it does fiscal 20, the year that Dan was talking about where we had to bring all the department heads in and say, to make this work, where do we cut? Um, this feels like a workable budget. Um, you know, the town has, has dialed back all of the department requests to, to level service and then made up the difference with free cash, um, you know, moved some of our capital expenses to ARPA. I think that it would not be unreasonable to ask the district to take a look and do the same. You know, if it may not be the year to pull 500000 from ESSER funds into the budget if there's available one-time revenue to hope that Hold Harmless ends next year and we get some more state aid. If they really feel that that's going to happen next year, it's probably an appropriate time to use one-time funds and bridge that gap rather than make cuts and try and build back when we have more revenue. Um, but th this feels like a budget that can work, um, you know, when everyone's working together. So uh, I want to thank the yeah, Finance Committee for the last three months, all the work they've put in. I know I think four members of this board once served over there. So um, we know what it's like. Can I just add one more thing, Mr. Chairman? Um, with just following up on Dan's announcement about the open houses, these are these are critically important capital projects that we have in front of us. And I think it's really important that we draft a projected debt schedule, I think, in the near future, so we could give the taxpayers some indication of what we're heading into. Right. Uh, I think it's uh, for, for the three projects, and a lot of people get lost in when, they, when they're adding up, you know, big major capital projects, but we do have the Votech uh, that's going to come up with a, you know, a, a, a sizable project that is also a much needed project. So I just think at some point before town meeting, I think it would be very helpful to present to town meeting and let the taxpayers know what the implications are going to be uh, for their future. I think all three of these projects are critically important. Um, actually, that, that probably was going to be one of the things that we talked about in the fiscal outlook, that we were going to do some debt projection and debt analysis as it uh, compares to our financial policy. Um, but as far as time goes, I, I think we need to get on some type of uh, basically the same page where we're going to support this budget. You know, we, we've I've seen the Finance Committee stick to the 5%. And I think you and I had a conversation early on that 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 was going to be key probably in this in this budget cycle to make sure that we were not going to be at odds over where we were saying that we could have properly afford you know fund the schools. And I think although the Madden report is is getting a little dated at this point and probably needs some type of refresher, he is kind of spot on. And even he in that report says there will be times where you're going to have to go outside of those guidelines. Um, but I also think this budget cycle is getting lost a lot in percentages as opposed to real money. It's very easy to say the school can go up 3.41% and the town can go up 3.41%. Well, if the town can do that, why can't we? I don't know. It's a difference of $900,000. Um, you know, and we talk about the fire line going up, what was it, 13% was their, their original ask. Well, if you look at the school budget, total administration cost up 21%, $245,000, less than, less than, completely less than what fire is looking for at 13%, I mean, sorry almost what sixty five thousand dollars more than and that's one subset of their budget now I, I i do hope you you sit down with this and you download their documents because there's some pretty big increases in in this document that 
Don't, it isn't all for the kids. I think we also need to get a, a on the same page of, although there's services they need to add, maybe this is not the year to add services. You know, sit, sitting at March 21st, it, it is a little bit late. And I think this year, I'll go back to say, is, is different than past years because although they had previously gone in high, it was a lot earlier. And by the time they had to actually set an assessment, this had been worked out. It, it's pretty scary to think that they only have two meetings. And, and I didn't see a lot of give in, in people uh, willing to give in that budget. I think they only had one, two members vote against it, one for a reason um, that didn't really seem entirely budget related to me. Um, and only one actually pushing back and actually said that this budget could result in a loss of town employees. And I didn't see anybody really get nervous with that. Um, if there's any other finance committee members that want to speak, if not, I'm going to open it up to department heads if they want to speak, and maybe we'll s circle back okay. and, and respond to those things after. Just have I think Sean Kane brought something up that was really important in that meeting and that some of our issues uh, stem from, for sustainability for the school, stem from um, hold harmless and really not being able to get out of that. And, you know, I wanted to know if there was a plan while we move forward. Um, essentially, you might not be able to pay your way out of hold harmless, but you can provide services that make just like if you had a business, provide a service that people want to be there with. So when we're sort of, if we want to stabilize police and fire, you know, it would be really nice to get that two million and keep it stabilizing the schools so that we could begin to have that money for town money. But that hold harmless does keep us sort of anchored and in a place where we have a lot of the departments pitting. What's our plan to provide those services or allow, um, those school committee members to provide services that are very attractive. What's our plan for that? Because long term, that could be the solution for everybody. And, and I don't know uh, if Sean, you want to speak on that, or if you just sort of recognize it as an issue. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I don't mind. Um, it's one of those things that you, for years, many of us have been doing research about these topics, and still they're they're kind of they're not very easy to, to comprehend. The bottom line is when when a school's, there are a number of factors that, that implement hold harmless, but when a school's enrollment is decreasing, it's one of the major factors that feeds into their, their funding through, through the Department of Ed. So for the last, whatever it is, 11 years, the school's enrollment has steadily been decreasing. When that's the case, in order to, to keep the districts in a place where they're okay, the district doesn't, I mean, the DOE doesn't decrease funding to the schools. It keeps them, like, it keeps them pretty much stable. So it doesn't take away funds because they lost enrollment. It just keeps them stable. But what that, what happens and what that means for the, for the budget, the repercussions are they have a $60 million budget that needs to increase at three, a little over 3%, but they're only going to get less than 1% from the state. And they make up whatever it is, 50% of their budget at least. So it leaves a budget gap. That budget gap over the last 11 years, unfortunately, has created this dynamic in town where the schools are fighting to, to just kind of keep their head above water and the department heads are trying to implement their own strategic plans and wondering <laughs> if every year the schools are going to ask for more and more money, you're just going to whittle away at departments. So what do we do? And there's not an e it's not, there isn't an easy solution. I feel like Hopefully, 10 years from now, we'll look back at this time and think, geez, you sat on a committee during that time. That must have been really difficult because it really is unfortunate, both for the school committee and for other department heads. You want to implement your strategic plan. You want to, you want to implement growth and, and increase your services. But this has really done a number on our community. Hopefully, we're in the last year. But it's not so easy as, I mean, as we looked into the the consultants from the state. It isn't so easy to just say, if you do this, then you'll be out of hold harmless because there are a number of factors. Um, but 
to be honest. The way that we have funded the schools over the last so many years has been just at a level that they have been able to actually make some progress. By funding them at 5%, roughly, we've been able to do things like add full day K and add some teachers. It's kind of like it was right at the level that <clears throat> it kept us right in the threshold of just enough to progress a little bit. Look at class sizes. Their class sizes are much better now. You know, so hopefully next year is the year that we kind of step away from hold harmless, but that's not a guarantee. It isn't a guarantee. We can look at some of the um, some of the factors and try to mitigate some of those things, but it's really not easy. I think that the, the best thing that we can do is stick to the financial policy that we have put into place. We paid consultants, we, we put committees together, although everybody doesn't completely agree and it's not perfect, at least it is some middle ground that we can fall back on. The 5% is known, it's a stable place that we, can, that we can move ahead from. If we just stick to that, I think over the next couple years, we'll be okay. If we move away from that, I think things would get a lot worse, you know, because to move above the 5% on the school end means to go to hit a department somewhere in town, and that's not what we want to do. Um, and obviously to cut the schools below the 5%, significantly below the 5%, then we're looking at, you know, some big reductions that way. So I'm looking at more slow, incremental, positive change, no drastic big change. And I think that's what the policy is allowing us to do. It's just kind of be stable and move in a direction that we can be okay with. Ms. Conley. Thank you. Um, there was predictions that were, were pretty successful. We've jumped out of hold harmless significantly. We're close to 600,000. That was something that people said just a few years ago or a year ago that that would be impossible. So there were people that did understand it, I think, or had a, had a general idea. It is, as you say, um, very complex and trying to strategize is like a market understanding what do people want to want in your school and understanding what to provide but some of the things that help that we've seen um, uh, people have been talking about is new schools create more enrollment so you have a brand new school people want to come to your school that can help um, the pre-k and as you said we're we're going to look at um, next year we've got a large graduating class so, uh, you know, it's, it's not just the money that we're spending now, it's going to be the money that we lose in aid. And that's the part that we can begin to stabilize our police, our fire, our local government. That's the section that's missing. If we don't make sure that this loss of aid is corrected, we're always going to be in this situation. So what is that? I think we need to get back to the table and, and better understand a, what we did really well last year, because we did something really well last year, or I have to say the school committee did something really well yet last year, by providing a service people want. And that's why people, the kids are at that school. So identifying how the new Student Opportunity Act gives more money to certain groups. We have uh, more ESL, so we got more aid as well. We have more um, low income, we got more aid as well. Um, identifying those things and uh, better servicing those communities. Thank you. And that's why we have a school committee. Actually, we're going to open it up to <coughs> department heads. So whatever the department head wants to go first, and then we'll get to you. If we have time, we'll go to some public comments. <coughs> Good evening, Board of Selectmen, as well as Finance Committee members. Um, I'm going to touch on some things that were brought up just now in this meeting. And so some of it will be duplicitous, but I hope it makes a point, and I hope you can understand where we are from the perspective of the Police Department budget. So the request for FY 2024 I'm going to direct you down to the uh, police salaries line, the all other services line, as we call it, um, <coughs> and how that's based on the Madden report. <clears throat> so 
So the Madden report was published before COVID, before police reform and additional post-commission regulations that all police agencies must comply with. The police department budget issues with respect to the lack of funding in the police salaries line was never addressed in the Madden report. Although the problem existed prior to the Madden report, it was made known at the time. This continues to be a problem year after year because there's no mechanism in place in the Madden report to correct the issue. So we are at that deficit. Um, can you bring that up here, Josh? So you're at the second to bottom line. The requested 2024 is 3,155,040 with a difference of 380,498, which um, was brought up earlier as a difference of 12.06 in that line alone. All right, we're going to get to the next slide. How did I get to that number? <clears throat> the 23 voted police salaries line, 2,774,542. We calculated for the shifts not filled. Um, that happened to be 643 shifts, uh, but we calculated at 575. We don't need all of them filled. We just need to get closer. So the average hourly rate of overtime for a police officer, it's not the highest, it's not the lowest, it's right in the middle, is 6274. You multiply that times an eight-hour day, that gives you 501.92 times 575 shifts, gives you that 288.604. Um, off to the right, just as you can see, um, for a point of reference, 360 shifts is one full month of unfilled police service. That's four officers per shift times three shifts per day is 12 shifts. 12 shifts times 30 days is 360 shifts. These are the shifts that we are unable to fill based on yearly budgets. So where does that fall into the Madden report? We can't go up 2% or 2.5% until this gets, this gets rectified. In years past, previous chief made the notation that uh, these are the shifts we're not filling. When I became chief, I put that into a dollar amount and added it right back into the budget. I'm going to continue to ask for it until it gets, you know, much closer to being rectified. Um, to everyone's benefit, we have been making strides uh, in, in re more recent years, but um, we're still not there. So the deficit <coughs> that we're looking to overcome is that amount. Uh, we did increase by 3% at the bottom, um, and that's to cover contractual increases based on... Oops, can we go back, Josh? Yeah. Okay, so I'm bringing this to your attention because at that school committee meeting on 3-8, uh, those finance committee member comments, a lot of which have been addressed, I'm going to get to the problem. There's a lack of context regarding any explanation of why any particular budget request was necessary. I can't help but assume that at least one of the budgets referred to is the Whitman Police Department budget. Um, also in that statement, um, Chair Howard, in previous meetings, you said we're not going to go for five if there's other budgets that are getting more than two. Our budget is not based on what anyone else is requesting, including the school district. We ask for what we need. Um, we already went through the fine-tooth comb, but we will, at the FinCom, go through with a fine-tooth comb to the extent that you can for a $60 million budget. Be able to support our challenge, but probably support it's biased towards the school district and against any other town. That's where we come to the divide based on those statements. And that is the issue. Um, scroll down to get the rest of it. 
unfortunately. All right. That's the slide. Just the spotlight. <laughs> Again, don't worry about the 5%. It's biased in favor of the school district. And we already talked about there are fictitious numbers out there. I'm not going to get into that again. Um, moving forward, to put this in context, This graph shows the annual budget increase by department from 2012 to 2022. Police is in blue, fire department is in red, school district is in green. If you were um, in finance and you were going to invest some money, which, where would you like to invest your money? Which line? I'd, I'd invest in the top line because that's going to give you the most return. Um, this is not coming out the way I want it to. to. So that slide isn't isn't working, although it is on the So basically, overall, when you look at that graph, the police department went up. Did you get? Um, within the Madden reports guidelines, okay. And um, what we're trying to do is get funded properly. So there's no mechanism to do that. I just don't know how to rectify this. And I know Selectman Kane basically said the same thing. You're just going to rehash the past year's issues. And that's where we're going from. But, um, I hope that slide probably would have made a little bit more sense to us if it came out the way it was presented off there to the left. It is what it is. So I wanted to put some context with it in relation to the police department budget and as to why we're requesting what we're requesting. So that's where it falls as far as I'm concerned. Anyone have any questions of me? I think we talked about Madden. I think we talked about, oh, sorry, I'll wait to the chair. Yeah. I think we talked about the Madden. We talked separately. A finance committee has to consider change in the law. The laws for your funding changed after the Madden report. Is that correct? Where you had. It's related you, to. Uh, related to, to your requirements, yeah, post, which could you give a, a general idea of how that. I know that that's a big expense when I talked to the, the chair of the post committee that, <laughs> that we would have to. Yeah, through that, I, but we still don't have an amount that that might include, and that might be something that we're talking about a little bit more of change in the laws, change in funding, change in things that are affecting again the school and how we might how to fund them to uh, receive our aid and and fund you to meet those requirements and um, and have what you you need. So how relevant? So I don't want to hijack this yeah. meeting and and talk about all the um, the police department issues. Um, we were able to get this slide up. So what happens is at the bottom, uh, just to verify some numbers, over that 2012 to 22 year 
period, the police department has gone up collectively $711,001 for 2.46% um, increase. The fire department went up 6.13% and a total over those same years, 1,656,929. And the schools, for, for contrast and comparison, went up 6.04% to the tune of $7,115,224. Um, so, and the other thing that I did want to point out in the, in the fire department budget, not to get, again, into public safety, but they did have a year, um, I believe it was 18 or 19, that they added four firefighters. And that was approved at town meeting. And obviously the townspeople wanted that and they got it. The increase to I don't ships. have a problem with that. Yeah. I don't really have a problem with the way Article 2 is. Um, you know, we work with departments. We don't try to devise mm -hmm. and divide us. We try and work together collectively. And that includes the schools too. But um, yeah, over the years, 711,000 compared to 7 million that's a drastic dollar amount. Not talking percentages, I'm talking dollar amount. So that's what I'm trying to highlight is the difference. So any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Sure. Thank you. I think oh, Mr. Nunn. <coughs> Sir. Uh, first of all, I think it should be clear that the Finance Committee hasn't voted on any budgets yet. Um, but, and I, this was kind of, other than the stuff we received today by email, um, I wasn't aware that there was a subcommittee of sorts looking at every town budget. Are you satisfied with the adjustment that was made by the subcommittee of sorts looking at the budget in the last week or two? Um, honestly, we saw it earlier today. Is that what you're referring to? The, uh, the one no. that Mary Beth presented? That's the only one That's I... That's what we got right. today. Yes. Um, Is that an acceptable level of support? We are team players. We've always been team players. I think you can see that, and that's why I brought up this, um, this particular uh, screenshot to kind of highlight that. Um, it was brought up to us in the past. It's not what you are requesting. It's like, what can you live with, was a statement made by other people um, who have since moved on from the Finance Committee. But So that's what we've always worked together with other departments. Um, for another example, um, Chief Clancy and I attended the IT presentation and spoke on his behalf and how he needs his budget to be where it is and how he presented it. And um, we'll continue to do that because <coughs> that's what he needs to make his department work. And he's revamped that whole system within his budget to make it work for everybody. Um, we'd be lost without them. So that's why Chief Clancy and I went to that meeting, just in support. But when you say something to the effect of you know, maybe the public safety budgets can, um, can kick some money over to the IT department. That's, that's kind of where we draw the line. So these comments get made, and I'm up here to clarify those, that in no way, shape, or form, that's not why we were there. We were there to show our support for the IT budget. Um, if you're asking me, can I live with that number that was presented? Yeah, we're going to make it work. Is it ideal? No. But like I said, we were working to, towards this incrementally, and I'm okay with that. As long as tomorrow is better than today and next year is better than this year, I get it. We fully understand that we can't, <laughs> you can't just come up here and say, you know, end over a, a 10 or a 12 percent increase. I understand that. And that's where I come from is. Um, we've been doing it for so long, it's unfortunately become kind of commonplace, but at this point, we can't um, continue to do this. We have to be moving in the right direction, and that's what I'm trying to 
get across today. So we're going to continue to work with the departments. Um, would I rather have it fully funded and be able to fill shifts and have the public covered and be able to do some additional things that we used to do but we don't do anymore? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Evening, Board of Selectmen, Town Administrator Carter, and the Finance Committee. I just want to briefly speak to you. As the Fire Chief, I am directly responsible for the operations of the Fire Department. It is my responsibility to see the daily operations, including fire suppression, fire inspection, emergency medical services, and also emergency management to the community. These are responsibilities I hope people know I take very seriously. Recently, I presented a budget to the town and also the Finance Committee. This is a fair and equitable decision agreement that was reached between the collective bargaining agreement and the town that was fair and equitable for all parties involved. As we move forward, as I said, these are factual numbers. One thing I want to point out is every financial meeting we go to we're brought up with the Madden report, talking about our increases and our limits. We understand this is a guideline. But I also have to say the Madden report was delivered on November 18, 2019. A lot in the world has changed since 2019. The economy has changed, and we survived, still surviving, a worldwide pandemic, which still affects the way we deliver public safety to this day. It has forever changed how we do our jobs. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. In recent weeks, there's been several comments made at school committee meetings that have brought great concern to us. We understand people have their opinions, and have their right to opinions, but it becomes concerning to us when it feels that one department is getting pitted against another. As Chief Hanlon said, we are team players. I will live within the confines of what the town can support me with and still provide the best services to the community I can. I will not read all my quotes. One thing I want to point out is in a recent school committee meeting, one member took a stand and mentioned if the proposed school budget went through, the town of Whitman could face layoffs of police, fire, and DPW workers, as well as town hall workers. That fell on deaf ears. There was not one comment made about that. There wasn't even a comment of, oh, we would not want that to happen. There was dead silence. The look on that member's face was almost amazement. They had, they had the guts to say what everybody was thinking, so but he actually came forward and said it. And it's deeply concerning to me that it comes up and no one seemed to care. I would hate to get to a point, as Chief Hanlon said, where we're pitting one department against another where one department's budget is being increased, where another department's operating budget of services are being decreased. We will continue to be town players, team players, and work with the town and the other department heads. One thing I want to put to rest, we have heard recently that department heads are pitted against one another. It's the farthest from the truth it could be. You see many department heads this evening in support of one another. We collectively have one goal, to work together to provide the best services to the citizens of the town of Whitman. And that is why we're all here tonight. The budget to end. The budget I presented was factual numbers based upon contractual obligations and what I see is needed to provide the best services and also the highest level of services to the community. I feel this is important because this is what the residents want, need, and most importantly, the residents deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other department head want to speak at this time? And I will then open it up to any further comment, maybe some public comment if anyone in the public wants to speak. Or Mr. Small is a school committee member, if you're speaking as a school committee member. Or... Uh, I'm going to speak for myself. Uh, <clears throat> although I am a school committee member and I was the one that made mention of those uh, comments in that meeting, so I will wear that badge. Just wanted to uh, address the hold harmless, and that's basically all I wanted to say. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next year. Uh, Rob O'Donnell from DESE, one of their financial experts, uh, who had conducted a seminar for us not too long ago about how, to us, how we can get out of hold harmless. And his impression at that point was, you're not getting out, it's not going to be easy. Uh, this year was the perfect storm. We had the kindergarten enrollment. Now they're not counted as half a people, they're counted as a full person. So the enrollment 
uh, Tedeschi went up. You have English language learners and low income. Those are numbers that are behind the scenes that also boosted up our need. So they look at that as part of the hold harmless in the foundation budget, et cetera. Uh, we don't know next year. I would hope that we will be able to wipe out the 600,000 that we're hold harmless now and then increase you know, for, on top of that. If we weren't in hold harmless, we would have seen millions. Uh, other districts and other towns around do see substantial monies. Uh, it has been, as Sean uh, had alluded to, and I've been saying it for years, when you're covering 45 to 50 percent of your budget on state aid, on Chapter 70 money, and it's not increasing as the same portion as your budget, you have to look at the towns to backfill it. And the towns simply can't sustain. It's not sustainable. Uh, so that is the budget plight uh, right now. Uh, it's my hope that uh, the committee will get to work. Uh, as I said, I'm only speaking for myself, though. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Galvin. Uh, John Galvin, 41 High Street. Um, I just want to get some clarifications on some statements that were made today. Um, I heard a statement from a couple people here that we have almost a balanced budget as it's um, produced right now with the school at 5%. Um, I'm just wondering how that is because what I'm looking at is still a deficit of about $258,000 with the school at, f at 5%. Um, I thought I heard maybe something that there was going to be some one-time money used for that. So um, I guess I'll ask that question first. I do have another statement. Yes. Um, in the budget document that um, I sent out along with the warrants, we are using um, free cash, $258,036 to close the gap. And after we use that, there will be $316.75 left out of free cash money, as the articles read today. Okay. All right. Obviously, a substantial investment out of free cash overall for all the capital items, and as well as going to the um, going to balance the budget, the one-time money. Now, I, I understand the use of one-time money this year, where we're looking at substantial increase of local receipts with the cannabis revenue that we're hoping to get in fiscal 25, so it makes sense. Um, another statement that I'd, I'd like to get clarified is um, we don't have control over one line item in this budget, and that's the school line item. Um, we can say 5% all we want, but if the school doesn't change that certification, it has to stay. We can't remove it. We're also required as a town to submit a balanced budget at town meeting. So if that number stays in there, we now have a $560,000 deficit that needs to be addressed before April, what'd you say, April 15th is when the warrant has to close. Yes. So I'm curious if the school committee decides not to change that, will there be a budget created that balances that with the school at the amount that they're at right now. Because that will need to be done if they don't change the certification. I, I, I'll answer that and I'll say I think that was also going to be part of the next discussion. But what I would assume, and again, this is just me and I, I don't want to speak for the board, is you will see something that's happened in the past where there will be a submittal of a uh, full, you know, full assessed amount from the schools with cuts made in a secondary uh, selectman's recommended budget and try to get that budget voted on town hall floor. Understood. Thank you. And again, if there any of the other board members want to chime in on that, I'm pretty sure we'd probably be discussing that in depth next. I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard, uh, that's a dilemma to be in for sure. For me, I guess what I would ask is for them to respect 
the res respect the situation that we're in, and if they are asking for more funds, simply to request an override. You know, to me, that would be the right way to do it, to, to, to say, listen, we understand where you're at, and we know that we're putting you in a difficult situation, and we know that 5% is the number that you're, you're looking for. However, we might be thinking about more, or we, we want more to fund the services that we're, we're asking for, therefore we're going to ask for an override. I think that's the appropriate way for, um, you know, Chief mentioned the, the four firemen that, were, that we had the override for, you know, years ago. And I thought that was, I thought that was great, and the, the town supported them. If that's the situation they feel like they're in as a department, I think that's the right way to go about it. I think the, it, would, it would be terrible to be on the, on the town meeting floor if they decided to ask a number above 5% and refuse to, to ask for an override. Um, that, I think that would really be, be, would not be good for the town and the community. May I comment on that? Um, you have to be real careful how that override is worded. Um, if you remember just two years ago, Hanson went for an override that was basically to fund the schools. But because, again, if the certification is at a certain level, if that override doesn't pass, it's not the school that suffers. It would be other departments that would suffer. So the school would have to do what they did several years ago in which certify a budget based on an override not passing and then ask for the override to pass. So if it's not done that way, then if the override doesn't pass, the school still gets it, whatever it's certified at. So we just need, need to be real careful how we go forward with that. And so would the school. Mr. Small. I believe a few years ago, uh, the budget was split on the warrant. Uh, so there was a line item that was subject to an override, and the secondary was you know, for the balance of the budget. And I think that's how it was accomplished. I don't know that it was the district itself requesting that. I think that was done through the town. Uh, it would be of grave concern because the regional school budget, if it is passed on town hall floor, it's passed. That goes first. Uh, the way Hanson had done it, if I'm not mistaken, they passed that portion. So everything was right on the backs of public safety when they went for their override. Uh, yeah, can be uh, can be a slippery slope, so to speak. Ms. Garland. So if it's a level service, I don't know if they regularly. I mean, we can't. We have no control. It's a bill, but my concern would be that <clears throat> we would risk, you know, the situation that Mr. Galvin says, and then that falls on our employees and. We'd also need to be looking at an override, like what's going on with Hanson's finances? Do they need this? Is it just our town that would be facing losing jobs and other things? So, you know, essentially the override in the town is also an option and that that's up to the selectmen to choose that option. But if ultimately it's the same uh, consequence, whereas we, we'd have more control and be able to preserve that money within the town. So that would be, up, up to the selectmen, of course, but um, that that's also, if you're talking override, it seems a little convoluted to to do it through the schools because it is a, supposedly a level of budget. Of course, we're going to review that a little bit. And, well, we're really uh, not talking override at this moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So it, it hasn't been discussed yet. Um, you know, wh what I'm hoping is, hopefully, you know, is some. You guys have where we're looking, you know, what we're looking at right now. I would like to hopefully come to some consensus on that. And I know the school committee's not meeting tomorrow, but the meeting the following week. And I think it's pretty important. I think, you know, if the discussion continues tonight, if we're sticking with our 5%, which has been the, where FinCom has been since the Madden report for the school district. Why are we moving off of it? Why are we giving the appearance that we're moving off of it? This board certainly isn't. This board took a vote, although it doesn't seem like it's ever been fully understood at the school committee level, of a up to a 5% assessment. 
That's fiscal policy for the town that was set. Uh, I say something right now? Uh, that being said, the schools knew right up front what the towns could afford by saying we'd go 5% over, uh, we can do an increase of 5% over our uh, amount that was the previous year assessment. That being said, you would think that they would use that as the ending of their, their budget, knowing what we can afford. Now, I don't know where Hanson is sitting on the issues. If you know if they're if they're looking at possibly uh, <laughs> such an increase that they can't afford, but the fact is, the schools knew exactly where our dollar figure stopped, and they should have been able to work on that number and then go down of what they can afford. It's that simple. Um, well, you I mean, don't spend money. You you don't spend money you can't get. What? And I don't want to outright say that we would never go over 5% if it was available, you know, just like there is wiggle room, and, and Mr. Madden said that in his report. But what he did say is increases of an assessment of 6%, 7%, 8% are not sustainable. Um, I think with the school budget this year, we don't need to keep talking about it only grows 3.41%. What, what you need to look at is what the net school spending went up. And that's $2.2 million put on the t both towns. I believe we're taking in one point. Total revenue projected this year is? About 175. 175. Yeah. Yeah. So we could, and Mr. Evans pointed this out at the last school committee meeting, if we, do, we can afford the schools and to pay? Uh, Plymouth County retirement. Retirement. So if we're talking equity, and I heard that word a lot too, and that's something I'm on board with. I mean, it isn't right, but it isn't right. Uh, that, that's a school district issue. They let it pr progress, but if we're talking equity, it's equity between every department head in the school in this town, in, in the school district. And I think this budget that has been presented to you provides that equity. And if you look dollar for dollar, the equity is there in this budget. I don't see any uh, budget that is receiving generous increases over the school district when you look dollar for dollar. I just just want to follow up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just to say that I, I appreciate the fact that we have town departments here, the presentations that were made. Um, I, I just hope that the Board of Selectmen recognizes the fact that the Finance Committee has only had this balanced budget for two days. So with that in mind, I would hope that we have an opportunity to take a look at it. But I think historically, we uh, we support all of the town departments, uh, you know, regardless of, you know, if there have been some out of context comments or whatever. I think by and large, the members of the nine members of this committee are committed to every town department and do not want to see services that the taxpayers have come to expect be eroded uh, by an unreasonable uh, assessment. So I think with that in mind, like I said, without making a commitment on percentages or, you know, I, I just would hope the board would allow the finance committee to at least digest the budget that was presented two days ago. Absolutely. And, and I'd also just like to add, and I know Ms. Sotina seemed like um, you received some criticism tonight, but I respect what you said about the misstatement, absolutely. Because I, I think all of us who have had to get up there and speak off the cuff have probably not phrased it exactly the way we want to. So I, ab I absolutely <laughs> respect that. Yeah, Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman, if you don't need us, we'll adjourn to the Finance Committee so you can dispense with the rest of your business. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate everyone. Thank you.
It's yeah. safe to assume we're going to go for it. We haven't done that. We have no way. Right here, two left. It's an initiative, right? Whitman people, so that they're kids who are within the limits, within one mile, within one mile. Right. Thank you. So, we free that. That'd be wonderful. Or, see what you do is you give, you're giving the parents a response. The parents, because I'm in town, so I just get together. All right, I did see, I did see the clerk. <clears throat> I was going to ask the board if we could take that discussion out of order before the. Yeah. Um, she because she's. That makes sense. I think you may need to. They really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump to the COVID update first. Oh, I don't know where she went. All right, Chief Clancy, COVID update. <laughs> Sent out yesterday, I think. Said you might want to be. She's out there talking to her. Uh, News show. Police chief did now, Betty. Hmm? The police chief did now. Oh, no, no, you go ahead with it. I saw that. I'm like, oh, that's a big number. That's not helping. But I think he was saying because we're not staffed, we have to keep throwing a big number. Okay. COVID update, Chief Clancy. Good evening. Uh, once again, I'm happy to report the town this past week had 11 cases out of 227 tests performed for a positivity rate of 4.85%. Uh, this number is remaining steady and it remains constant with the decrease we saw two weeks ago by over 50%. We will hope this number continues and we hope to stay leveled out for now without any, without any significant spikes either way, or up I should say. I do wanna let you know the town has been approved for the wastewater testing machine We'll be uh, moving forward and getting that into place and operational, which will help with the wastewater monitoring. On a side note, the wastewater monitoring, if I forwarded that along the other day, you can see that that has also dropped down. So it appears that we are overall are trending down with our COVID numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now the clerk's back. Um, again, I'm gonna ask the board if we can just take this out of order and, and have this discussion. Uh, due to her injury. We'll, we'll get her out as soon as possible. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about is uh, the Whitman Middle School building project. Uh, we'll, we'll revert back, but with the clerk here, I'd like to discuss uh, the timeline and get a little bit more information on uh, the ballot vote. All right, you guys, everybody ready? Sure. Does anybody have specific questions? I can just go over some numbers. I, I know that, um, well, first off, does, does anybody have specific questions before I? I mean, I guess, um, <coughs> Chair, if I could, this board was considering when to hold the special town election for the middle school. Uh, I'm most curious on what the impact would be to your department on either holding a special town election immediately before a presidential primary in like the month when we're probably already early voting? Mm -hmm. Or um, would it be, is it possible or would it be more difficult to hold it concurrently and have a single day two ballot election? So that's kind of where I'm at. So the single single day, um, day two ballot election is disastrous, um, especially with it being a presidential primary. What happens is you basically run two elections. You have to have two check-ins, you know, we don't have checkout tables anymore, but you have to have two check-ins. You can't sell the ballot. So if somebody comes up and they say, you know, I, I want a Democratic ballot, you can't say, well, do you want, you know, the debt exclusion too? You, you can't. Um, we basically own the election, so you don't get state reimbursement. You do have to have early voting, just like the state elect, but the primary would have and all that stuff. You, you know, you don't have an option of opting out of anything. You have to follow the state guidelines for that. Um, if you do a mail, if you do the mail-in ballots, the, um, the permanently disabled or the absentees or the early voting ballots by mail, um, you, I would mail them separately in separate, I would put different um, labels on them. Um, like a, a bright, we have, um, we've done this before. I've done a, a dual election before. We did bright pink and fluorescent green and they have to put the specific, they'd get instructions so whatever ballot would have to go in the bright pink would be whatever ballot we'd tell them. 
we wouldn't know if they put the wrong ballot in the wrong envelope until the election time when you open them up to put them in. If that's the case, we can't say, oops, we'll switch them. They both become um, rejected ballots. Oh. So um, that's, that, I think, is, is a huge problem. Um, what I did in the, the last dual election is I mailed them out like a week apart so that hopefully the bulk of them came back before they got the second ballot, but that wasn't always the case. We'll have early ballot depositing. There'll be a lot of complications. Um, we have to have rent um, um, check-in machines, um, so the, the poll books, because you can't. You have to have to have two separate lists. One of the questions that Michael asked me was, um, you know, we, we've been you know brainstorming in our office was, if somebody came in and voted for the primary, went home and said, hey, did you vote for the debt exclusion? Could they come back? And the answer would be yes to that because it's two separate lists. It's two separate elections. Um, so that's kind of, I, I would um, strongly recommend not to do that. I would rather have um, a whole election in its entirety, and I do have some numbers in, in, um, um, with the numbers as far as the percentages or um, the, the number of people that came out and voted for a presidential primary versus a special election that we held for a two and a half. Um, you know, for the fire department, the extra guys was um, in 2002, yeah, 2002, we had 22%. Um, it is slightly higher, but it varies from year to year as far as the presidential. Um, we don't have a 2002 one, but in 2000, we had 34% for the presidential primary. Um, in 2004, we had 16% in the presidential primary. So if, if you averaged it out, um, we had some that were up higher. Um, we had 39% for an override. Um, at another election, we had 48% in another election. So I think if you averaged out the percentages, you know, um, the marijuana one, um, crazy as it is, we had the least amount, which was 8%, 850 um, voters came out for that one. But that's the only one that's really off for having its own special election. So, um, and the only thing that I would need would be like the 35 days in advance notice and um, and it would be its own, I think it would be like the cleanest form of an election if you want the clean, you know, and if, if you know, the, the, um, it can be advertised, it can be, you know, lots of things can happen to draw people's attention to it. As far as I know you had said about having more people come, mm -hmm. but I think here just shows you that if it's advertised and if the, the interest is there, which I think it would be, you would have the voters come. And I think, and not only that, in the March primary, you're gonna have, because um, it's a presidential, you're gonna have the um, town committees. And that in itself is a huge, um, a huge problem. <laughs> For my poll workers, it's just a difficult number because they vote for 35 people. So at the end of the night, after working 16 hours, they see a number of, you know, they only know a thousand people came out, just for instance, and they see a number of like 39,000. They're like, "What did I do wrong?" But they did nothing wrong. It's just, it's our already a hard election for the, the march. So <clears throat> your recommendation is to, to have it have a special election, or I mean, I don't know if it can wait till the annual but have a special election otherwise and not do it on the March presidential primary ballot. Mary Beth, do you have anything? Uh... Um, so I made, you know, some calls as well. Um, and they said that it's allowable, mm -hmm. which it is. Yep. Um, and two separate ballots would be needed, yep. which we know. And separate colors. Yep. It would save um, the town the cost of two separate elections in some ways. They, the gentleman I spoke with was the elections manager. Um, his name was Will. Is no, that who you said? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And they said you would receive the normal reimbursement for elections, but not on both. That's not true, though. On um, one, um, he said, we, will. We, yeah, that's not true. So just so you know, the people that you talk to in there never run an election. They've never, they've never, they've never ran, yeah, they've never <laughs> ran an election. So um, you don't get the full reimbursement because you, you they don't pay for things. They won't pay for the rental of the equipment. They won't pay for, do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, it's, we have to pay for our own, even with our, with our annual, we have to pay for all of our own stuff. It doesn't save you money. They, oh, not on everything, but they said the what they would reimburse is what? for. The, it's only three hours, anyways. By the way. Okay. It's he like said it just wouldn't be double 
for having two elections. No, That's what you're right. saying. It would right. just be whatever they were allowable yeah, costs would only be on the one. It's only for three hours because the federal law says you have to have elections for 10 hours. The state law says that they want the polls open for 13 hours. So they reimburse us for those three hours. So what I do is I fill out like a survey and you know, um, they say, how many police officers did, you, officers did you have? And I fill out a whole thing, how much my election workers got paid. And we get reimbursed just for those three hours. And it, it averages about $1,500, something like that. Okay. Oh. We own the poll pads that we would use for the election. But if you need a second poll pad, we would have to rent four okay. poll pads, which is at a cost that we don't usually have. Right. And the program cards that you put in the uh, election machinery, um, they don't pay for it. And they're expensive. Either one, too, saying if you have the dual election. If you have the dual. That's your own expense. Right. And they're expe that's expensive because you, you pay for word. It's for every word on those program cards. And then we have an auto mark, which is for handicapped, and we have to pay for that card as well. So and as far as cost, I don't think, personally, I don't think the cost is worth <coughs> the risk of the dangers of running a dual election. And, and you're not only talk, just talking, because I know, I remember Justin, you had talked, people saying two ballots, two ballots, there's more than two ballots. You get three parties, mm -hmm. then you have um, absentee ballot, early voting ballots, so now there's six ballots. Then you got the, would be the, the, the debt exclusion ballot, plus that has to have an absentee ballot or whatever. So you're talking about my office juggling eight ballots and making sure that we mail out the right one to the right person. And yeah. I'm just saying, it's not as simple as just, oh, two ballots and here you go. And, because so, you have three three recognized parties, but sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 no. Just going down the list, he said that in person, early voting would need to have the same hours for yeah. both, yeah. and that you would need double the the checkers. That's yeah. uh, what you had stated, and that you do need, which we know, 35 days from when the board of selectmen um, vote to set the election yeah. in writing. You need 35 days. Yeah. Can you tell me how many people turned out again for that? the first marijuana vote? The marijuana vote, only 850. It was on March 12th, 2018. Really? So, Durna. It's probably not a presidential. That's not a presidential. No, uh, St. Patrick's. Yeah, I thought that was March 17th. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, Mar it was, was a, March it was a holiday. 17th. <clears throat> and also, another thing, if somebody takes both ballots and they go in the booth, and they're like, oh, I didn't want this one. And they leave one in the booth and walk. We don't know whose ballot that is. There's just so many mm -hmm. problems that could arise. And that does happen. So what is the simplest, easiest way to have? To have, have it on the annual is the simple, because then, well, that's, I mean, but I, like I said, I know there's time. I know there's time restrictions that the school has to meet. But if it was on the annual, that'd be the cheapest because you're already paying for the election, and that's in May. But if you can't wait that long and you have to go before <coughs> then, then to have a special election. Special town meeting, a special election. A special town meeting's fairly reasonably as far as cost goes. And then a special election with just that question. Mm -hmm. That's what the fire did, like I said, in that, um, September 2002, and they got 22% turn out and it passed. I can give you this. You want to keep it? If you don't mind. I don't. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have a question? Uh, the percentages that you gave, uh, 2002, 2000, 2004, those were all special elections? Yes. Yeah, I have that. were not with any kind of a, a major. This has actually the breakdown. The question is, there's a May 18th one, so that may have been attached to the town's yeah. election. I realized it afterwards. So this is just the special town elections, and then these are the presidential primary elections with the percentages. And then this kind of tells you what it was, the school. And you had done a dual before, you said? I did a dual before. Is it on here? <laughs> I don't remember. I okay. did the work, I'm sorry. No, nope, that's okay. I don't remember what it was. It was when I first started in 2012. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I think I have a question for probably Mary Beth um, to follow up on. Mm -hmm. So since our last discussion, I have been thinking about um, would it be possible for us to hold a special town meeting, the first step in the MSBA process, 
in the fall early enough to capture the remaining excess levy before we set the tax rate. So this would be before the MSBA vote. Can we hold the town meeting before that if the town election is after that? Okay. The, so a couple of things that the, right. Yes. You're, you're talking excess levy. So yes. what is the? So it, um, if we have a fall special town meeting, mm -hmm. we could vote to capture the remaining excess levy if our estimate's a little bit off. Could we hold the middle school special town meeting early enough before we set the tax rate to capture whatever remains in excess levy, but it would likely be before the MSBA vote? I just don't know the MSBA timeline on that. I don't know what the timeline is. looks like is. John might, though. I have an answer for you there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I met with um, AI3, the architect, this morning, and the um, OPM. And we discussed what would the earliest possible time frame be where they could have um, the full cost estimates to the Board of Selectmen. Um, that time frame would be the end of September. So the Board of Selectmen could hold a meeting authorizing the vote for the debt exclusion in September. Um, we could have a special town meeting. I, my time frame was October 30th, Monday, October 30th, mm -hmm. with a special town meeting on Saturday, November 4th. That's actually before the date when a presidential election would be, because that presidential election would have fallen on the following Tuesday. So um, both the OPM and the AI3 both verified again this morning that they could have full financial uh, documents to the Board of Selectmen in time for an end of September, last week in September meeting where you could do what you need to do. That gives her the 35 days that she needs um, to, to, for the election. And my thought would be to have the town meeting a week before so it's fresh in everybody's mind and do, I do things so the same. I, I do like that proposal. So in that scenario, the selectmen would vote to hold a special town meeting and hold a special election with enough way. time to post a special town meeting 14 days in advance and a special town election 35 days in advance? 35 in the election, and I think it's 14 in the town meeting. Okay. But both of those would come before the MSBA. Well, yeah, well that's the thing. The, 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 uh, just to clarify that, too, sorry, and that's probably what you're going to say. Right. Um, uh, uh, we have been told by both um, the OPM and AI3 designers that, that, that the meeting is on October 26th, the MSBA mm -hmm. meeting. But that meeting is pretty much just a celebratory meeting okay. moving forward. Um, there isn't any... The chances of them saying no at that meeting are like, we won't even get to that meeting if they were going to say no. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the, it is before you are doing it before MSBA officially votes on it, but we're voting after. That's why I, did, the that's why I said after October 30th yeah. would be the early I should want it. More interested in that scenario now. <laughs> we are we're currently penciled in for that date. Yeah. Uh, we would need a waiver from them for that date because it's in excess of the 209 days from, or whatever the amount of days from when you're originally entered into uh, or invited into the process. And nobody feels it's going to be an issue. You know, so we could have that. Uh, that's what we're penciled in for. So. Okay. And a late October special town meeting could give us the opportunity to capture any remaining excess levy so that we're not in the same position that we ended up in this year. Mr. Chairman, may I speak on that? Okay. As far as the excess levy is concerned, and I've spoken a lot to the um, assessor and we've checked with the DOR as well, the excess levy is not known um, until the 11th hour, you know, right before the tax rate is set and the hearing is done. However, going forward, and that's if we want to go to the full levy, which means we're taxing the taxpayers the highest amount that we possibly can. Um, that amount is determined before the tax rate is set. So I've requested that once we know the excess levy, then we can evaluate um, the situation, whether or not we want to capture all of that. And there's two ways of doing it. We can either um, increase 
the overlay or we can decrease the estimated receipts to try to minimize the excess levy capacity. However, with rounding, you can never get to, you know, exactly zero. But once the tax rate is set each year, the excess capacity uh, is gone for the year, um, you know, and we cannot capture it. So that normally at the hearing usually takes place in November normally. So I'm not sure that um, we would have that excess levy capacity determined, you know, October. In October. Yeah. All right. Mr. Galvin. Um, comment on what she just said. Um, local receipts mm has -hmm. been commented. We're, we're really aggressive with those right now, right? So um, probably not going to generate a whole lot of free cash from that this year. Mm -hmm. um, to lower the excess, you know, excess levy, which we've done actually a couple years ago, um, by lowering our estimated receipts, that is an, also gives us the ability to, when those receipts come in higher, or if those come in higher, generates free cash for us. So that's not a bad thing to do. Um, the other thing, and, and we've done this the last couple of years, is we've had an article that's been approved at town meeting that says that any excess levy that we do have, we capture and it goes to a stabilization fund. And we've done that for two years. So either way, we're still not losing the money we're not appropriating it the way it is to its fullest but it, it is definitely a science not as well it's not a science it's it's a it's a artistic science kind of say it's it's not easy you know and I really give Ken a lot of credit um, coming up going outside the box and you know he may he and I may not agree we agree that what the formula that he's doing is is sound um, we disagree on the risk level that it's being taken, but that's my opinion, my opinion only. Um, but still, um, you know, so no matter what, we, you know, we're still not losing it. All right. I, I wish I probably near that. Uh, yeah, Rob. Well, I, 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 yeah, we're getting off track. I, I want to circle back to the vote, and then we'll go back to the a little bit more of a fiscal discussion. Um, Okay, so we've heard from the clerk, which, which was important. Um, my position has always been, I think we need to look at what, me personally, what draws more of the voting population out. So I have to look at this and say, consistently, we have more voting population brought out during a presidential primary. I can't go back to 1989 when the 3,000 people made up 48% of the town. Um, but I do look at the last three on this, and we're, we're consistently getting more people. That's always been the biggest thing, is having the, with a funding uh, question as large as what, what it is going to be. For me, personally, it's about getting the, the more voting population out to vote on that. That's my opinion, and I'm willing to take any, anyone else's if they want to give it now. Um, if not, I don't think we need a decision on this tonight. We can we can take it up. I, I do appreciate that it is more work, but sometimes more work it, it could be worth having more people take part in the election. Mm -hmm. If I may, Randy, I kind of agree with you. I think the voices of as many town residents that we can get on the on the vote is is the main thing. They need to let us know uh, whether they agree or disagree on how we're spending their tax dollars. How are doing an override? I, I agree. A debt exclusion, I should say. Um, their voices need to be heard. I think I need some other voices heard too from the, yeah. the board before we go to Mr. Galvin again. <clears throat> so that's um, if anyone else wants to weigh in right now. Sure. Right. Um, so looking at these numbers, they are, I think I, you could take the marijuana question out because I do think that was a holiday. I think that was St. Patrick's Day um, as a, as sort of the, the low point. Um, it's certainly higher on a presidential primary, but if you look at the, to, to make an assumption, non, where, where one party is not a competitive primary, um, 2004, 2012, um, 
I guess 96, it's more in line with what a special town election, particularly the override questions we're seeing. So I think the, uh, probably want to sit with these numbers a little bit longer, but I think the earlier vote standalone to make it a little easier on the office might make sense. I'm not so concerned with more work and more money. I don't mean to be crass about that, but I think if, it, if it's the right thing to do, I think we, we can find a way to help you out. But I am a little bit conf concerned about the confusion factor. You know what I mean? So I'd like to think more about that. I mean, I definitely want more numbers, more people, I think is really the way we want to go, but it's not going to be helpful if we get a ton of people and there's a ton of confusion. I think that could yeah, yeah, yeah. undermine the process. Yeah, I'm sorry if I came across as more work, because it's not the work. I've, we've been through presidentials. You talk about work and early voting. That will be nothing compared to what we've been through and what we're going to go through in 2024. We're not going to put our hands up and say, well, there's more work. It is way more confusing. It's confusing in-house. It's confusing to the voters. It's confusing to the voters that come in. It's confusing to the voters that will early vote by mail or whatever. It's mm -hmm. the whole process is very confusing. Like I said, if they don't put their ballot in the right envelope, it, it's rejected. It doesn't count. And and if they don't come up and say they we can't sell the ballot, so just because we have a higher turnout, we can't say, do you want a debt exclusion ballot? We cannot sell the ballot. We have to be very careful of how we say things when people come up. And you can't just hand it and throw? No. They have to know. They have to take some responsibility and yeah. know what they're there for. So yeah. what we can do is direct them to, say, the back wall. We, we would have specimen ballots, yeah. and we would say, if somebody says, what are you talking about, two ballots? We would then direct them to the um, back wall and say, those are your choice, you know, mm -hmm. those are what, what we have. And, and that type of stuff, you just have to be real careful what you say. Yeah. And uh, I just don't think it's as clean as, as you would if it was... All right, Mr. Galvin. I'm going to keep coming up here. Um, I'm not saying you need to vote tonight, but there there is a deadline that we need to file an extension for the MSBA on whether or not we're going to go to the October meeting, which would be the one to have it that we that I talked about earlier, or the December meeting. I'm not quite sure what that deadline is. I can find that out, but I would just once I find that out, I'll forward that to you to you guys and let you know um, what that deadline is because I don't think. We can wait too much longer. I would argue that anybody who has a passionate voice and wants to vote uh, will have that opportunity. Uh, you know, we will make sure that it's publicized, and I'm sure the town will make sure it's publicized to the point where interested parties will have the opportunity. Uh, to come out and vote. Uh, if there's going to be confusion at a presidential primary and you have people that are there to vote for a presidential primary and you may have them that don't even know that there's a debt exclusion. They don't know that that ballot's there. Uh, you know, I'd rather have folks or see folks that are there for the interest because they want to vote than someone that says, oh, Okay, and you know it's just there. Uh, you know, as far as that goes, I, think that too. So, I would hope you take that into consideration as well. I just have a request for Don. If um, if you could find the numbers if they exist um, for the last time that there was a combined election, a, a two ballot, whatever, however you want to describe it, if there was a drop off in turnout from one to the other. So if people showed up for the primary and not the the special. Um, that'll be interesting to know. I will get that right. I'll email it to Mary Beth and she can forward it to you guys. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to go back now to um, Chairman's report. I put, I put this on the agenda because I think it's going to cover a multitude of topics tonight, but um, I think we'll start with uh, some debt analysis. Um, Presented by Mr. Kane. Josh, can you switch the other slide or the other graphic? Sure. Is there a second one? Should be two. Scenario 1A? Which one are you looking for? The first one? Yeah, but do you have just this as a standalone? The graph itself? Yeah. Uh, I don't. It's okay if you don't. Um, we thought it would be helpful to analyze 
Yeah, cool. Thank you. There you go. I thought it would be helpful to analyze the, the potential debt with the DPW in the school. Um, it's hard to wrap your numbers around such high numbers. So we thought doing some due diligence and reaching out to a financial advisor, if we could come up with a simple chart just to evaluate what would this look like. You guys kind of started this last year when you implemented the financial management policy. The, right now, the current financial man management policy, just to read it exactly, says that excluded debt service costs should generally be less than 12%. That's the red line, meaning we have an excluded debt capacity of 12% of the tax levy. Tax levy is at about 30 million, so that's about 3.6 million dollars a year that we should be. This is a, a general guideline for healthy towns are in you know healthy fiscal states. They generally stay within the 12%. We got this from Duxbury as well. This was back when Scott Lambiasi was on the board. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of like a rule of thumb for municipalities to follow. And I think the red line gives us a, a pretty good target to feel. If you can see here, the blue, this is what we currently have for debt. So we have very little debt right now. It's mm -hmm. only the, the high school, which is coming off the books in a, in a couple of years, and uh, um, the police station and the, the oh, town hall. Fire station. So yeah. we really have very little debt right now, which seems like it would be a good thing. But actually, when you listen to some of the financial advisors, they say you have to be careful about that because we have a lot of capital needs, and if we're not carrying the debt capacity regularly, you can see that it must have slowly dwindled down and down and down, which means that when we add, the everyday person's tax bill is gonna go up significantly. We don't want a big, we don't want that big shift. So right now, we're significantly below the debt capacity, which is made pretty obvious by this chart. Can you see it, John? <laughs> <laughs> Move over. In orange here, in orange here, this is the DPW bill. So you can see the first year it comes in with just a little bit. This is because it must come in halfway through the year, I think is what they estimated. And then what that would add to our debt capacity. We can talk about the numbers in a second, but just so you can, you can generally get the graphic. This is at 16 million for 20 years. Um, so this is based on numbers that are accurate, but based on today's numbers, based on the financial advisor. But you can see the green is the schools. And the school at $72 million at 30 years for at 5%, I think, is the number that we Correct. get back, you can see that significant jump. So if we're taking a, just taking a motion out of whether you want schools or not or whatnot, and you're kind of looking at the cold math, you can see that the debt capacity, I think for about 11 years, that school, that school debt the, in green, just the school debt alone for about 11 years is more than 11%. I mean, more than 12%. You know, so that significantly puts our financially, our financial well-being at risk. And it's kind of a hard pill to swallow right now, especially considering that the committee has done so much work. But if our current policy says that we should not, it doesn't have to be right at 12%. And I reached out to Scott Lambiasi just to get some feedback from him about this. And he said, you don't need rigid numbers, but we know that this is generally where we want to be up to just for you know, to be fiscally sound. This is obviously significantly higher. Um, so I thought this would be helpful for the board to kind of consume a little bit. The numbers are really precise numbers as far as in the estimate, but it gets into actually multiple scenarios. If you want to do 20 years versus 30 years, they put in a two and a half growth rate versus not a growth rate, just for comparison. So there's a couple of different scenarios for you to pick apart on your own. Um, but just big picture, first pass at a debt analysis um, here, I thought that was a good, I thought they did a really good job with that graphic for us to be able to follow. I mean, it, it does speak for itself. I mean, we, I think we, I think some of us from the, the town side that feel the impact of the school mm -hmm. have been talking about this probably from the very first meeting. And I think probably that's why, when this was originally put out, there was that 50 to $85 million target to kind of fall into a sweet spot for the school, because if you probably puts us somewhere in that, you know, 12, 13, 14%. I look at this and I say, that school at 72 million stifles 
anything you're going to do in this town for those 10 or 11 years. Yeah. You, you, are, you are not going to be able to... You, you would struggle to get any other projects passed, I think, at that point. And you think, like, the comparison with the high school, why was it that we're able to afford the high school? How is the middle school much different? And, I mean, obviously, being in a region, the high school, we're, we're splitting that, you know, that cost. This is completely on, the, on Whitman, you know. And like you said, it's, a, it's pretty significant. I have a question. Would it maybe, uh, Fred can answer, would it <clears throat> make sense <clears throat> to downsize the building? You know, and to, to um, I don't mean by smaller, but I mean instead of, I mean, I know that the, the school that, you know, that your committee asked for or, or voted on is a pretty expensive building. The, the committee selected uh, a five through eight configuration as opposed to a six through eight configuration, and they also selected to go with an auditorium. Right. Uh, could, could it be downsized to the fact that where it doesn't cripple the town for 10, 12 years? I don't know that that's possible at this time where the schematic reports and designs are already in place over at MSBA and under review. So I don't know that we would have that option at this point. Uh, you know, the one thing I did want to say, and uh, the high school was 52 million and we were 60% uh, of it. And we did refinance at once, saving a boatload of money. 52 total to build that high school. I think we were in the 52 or 53 yeah. percent. It was SBA at the time, even, uh, you know, the paid. Uh, to do nothing at the middle school, the estimate to bring it up to standards uh, was $55 million. You know, so any way you do cut it, we would be looking at a significant impact to the town. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that's just the cold, hard reality of it. There's no SBA return on renovations? Well, rent, if we had done a, a reno, but I'm talking about repair. Yeah. Okay, just repair. The renovations were sky high as well. Because uh, then you'd have to meet all sorts of uh, different guidelines right. as far yeah. as sizing, width of halls. I mean, it got really, really complex. Uh, but just to do repairs and to take care of what's wrong in the building, uh, the estimate they gave us was $55 million. And But no, with no state funding? No state funding. It's all on the town? All on the town. And what would, all right, $55 million. And how I don't even know how long you could bond for that. There you go. That's a question. Can anyone answer? And what it would be? Can you bond Reno? For a Reno? Yeah. I could find out. Well, oh, repairs. Oh, repairs. Oh, Excuse repairs. me. Repairs. Yeah. I'm not sure if we could bond for yeah. repairs. Or how long we could. Right. It usually goes on the useful life of a of a building of a project. Well actually if 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 we go with here, how much of the new building would the town be responsible for? How much would that figure? Uh, we don't have the final, and we won't have that final until... Uh, well, it's a $127 million project, right? 127.5. It's right. estimated that you're looking at between 67 and 72 to the million town. Dollars. So it's, right, okay. So it's $20 million difference. And we get no... Hmm. Um, you know, there was also add-ons that were consider considerable. Uh, although it meets the educational plan, the fifth grade, uh, they said they had that grade of 17 to 20 percent more, correct, for the additional grade? For the, the amount, you mean? Yes. It, it, it was $12 million more for, it was $17 million more for with an auditorium. Five to eight versus six to eight. What's the auditorium? Right? That's, yeah, but and then that include you know then uh, that to us is about sixty percent of that. Um, Mr. Galvin also has done 
some pretty uh, excellent work trying to talk about impact to the taxpayer. Um, and I think at 72 million, it's about a 14 percent. Um, the average, the average taxpayer. So based on fiscal 23, I wish I knew this coming in. But anyway, fiscal 23 average impact to the average taxpayer who pays about $5,700 a year. I think um, it's a it's a 20 percent increase um, as of this shot in time. Five percent over 30 years. Um, it's about a little under a thousand dollars a year to the average taxpayer, um, but you can, you know, basically look at yourself and see what you pay, and multiply it times 0.2 and add that onto what you pay, and that's how it's going to impact you. Um, that's currently right now. You know, we're not going to bond this thing for several more years. You know, I mean, you've got it up there as 25 starting to hit. I think it's probably more like 27 or 28 before we're actually done. We'll be banning it the whole away and there'll be sub substantial amounts but we're only playing interest until it's completely done and then we'll bond the whole thing so it'll be a couple more years before those get really high but because that's when the you know it's not going to be done until like 28 probably and that's when we 27 20 27 is when we go in and then they got to demolish it that's what i asked today so we would we'll get in sometime the new building will be ready for occupancy around april of 2027 to June of 227, depending upon when we have our meeting, that's driving that whole thing. Um, <laughs> then we'll move into the old building, then they'll start demolishing the other building and that'll last about a year. So the whole, you know, a little less than that. So the whole thing will be done by summer of 28, complete. All right. Mr. Go. Chairman, so this projection here was for the 30 year. Um, originally, Sean, you had talked about maybe running a 20 and a 30, but 20 really wouldn't be doable at all. I mean, the numbers would be staggering. This is based on 72 million. While you can ban up to 10 years, the third year of a ban, you are required to pay a principal payment along with the interest payment. So, right, where will rates be when we go to actually uh, bond? So it's all those unknowns, but this is based on 72 million as it stands right now. And we certainly uh, can put together some numbers with the median household and what the impact would be. Um, Frank and I did some rough calculations and came up with a number a bit higher than you did, um, you know, 1,200 in that area, and I'll get some exact figures for $430,000 home or what, but I can get some more accurate figures for the next meeting if you'd like. I have a question. With the new, uh, with town meeting approval of having uh, three pot shops in town, mm -hmm. do you expect, do you have any idea what revenues may be coming into the town? We did put $100,000 in for a, just an estimate yeah. for revenue. Um, 100,000? We put $100,000 in the budget. Just right. But I mean, when they open and we start to get sales, you know, I mean. Well, you know, of course, with three of them, I mean, the first one that goes in is going to have, you know, quite a bit of the sale, you know, all yeah. the sales. And then it's three. We're not going to have three times, right. you yeah. know, it will be spread right. among those three. Um, but I don't have, um, you know, projections for beyond. Is there a one time? Sales? Number that the uh, tax rate, tax whatever that they give the town, you know, a lot of no, 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 no. So nothing. The, in the host community agreements, there's a three percent excise mm -hmm. tax that they'll pay back to the towns, and then uh, an up to three percent mm -hmm. impact fees for any community impacts that we justify or we can justify. Um, and we'll have to sort of work with, um, I think the accountant to itemize that and keep track of them, yeah. So that was my question as part of this too. Um, you know, where we do, we will see positive impact financially mm -hmm. from the marijuana. Um, but, but what we don't know is how does it get paid out? Right. Is the three percent we get uh, through the you know being a host community directly is that paid to to us as, as an almost like an excise or does it come through the state and when do you get that annually and yeah i talked to um appington's town manager about this when we were early in the process and they get their excise directly from the state i think once a year um i'm not sure when 
and the uh, impact fees are paid out on whatever was in the host community agreement. I don't remember what we put in there, but it was either once or twice a year. It wasn't. Um, and that's based right. on the change in the law. And now we have to really itemize and justify every expense. So, and, and just like I would say with the school budget, you know, you really can't base your budget on how Student Opportunity Act and is going to affect Hold Harmless, uh, you, you know, because we don't know. We don't know if that was the the big impact we saw this year and that are we going to be stuck at that point does it change just like with the town budget I, I would hate to you know forecast more and oh no and yeah. um this you know pl plan on money that we may never see come in to the extent that we estimated it mm -hmm. all right um i do think that that's it, it's definitely something to think about. Um, I think as part of the, the community outreach, that needs to be a part of it. Um, you know, and, and I think, and I'm the vice chair with you, Fred, I, I, and I know we've talked about it, but I think that messaging, it has to run parallel to the academic plan. It, it's great to sell the academic plan, but I think people need to know what they're going to be paying for that. Within the publicity that will go on around this, every aspect needs to be pushed out. Uh, you know, this is what it's going to cost. This is the projected cost. This is out of your pocket. Let people know what they're paying for. The benefits of the school, the benefits of different things, but having it completely 110% transparent so people can be informed and make their own informed decision, you know, uh, with nothing, you know, no stone unturned, nothing held back, everything right there for people. Right. That's the only way we can do it. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Anything to add more towards any budget type discussion now or? Just real quick. Um, I think it might be helpful, obviously, given the discussion today, and I sent uh, Mary Beth an email a couple of days ago. I think it might be helpful to, to look to, to contract more financial services um, as a consultant to come in and give us some more of this kind of thing, you know, looking over debt, looking over some of the ways that we're, that we're looking at forecasting, really the stuff that's spoken about in the strategic plan, um, how we communicate those things, because that's a big part of the financial aspect of the strategic plan. I think if we potentially put together a, uh, an article using a little bit of money, either from free cash or stabilization, to, to contract out some financial services to help in this way, I think it's a really, for short money, we get a lot back because we can be really intelligent and strategic about some of these financial decisions. And I think the one that we've made most recently was the Madden report. Um, and I think. We, we, we've seen the benefits by that. So I, I, I agree with Sean on this one. I, yeah. I, I think that Upgrade it. I, I would just like to see maybe in the budget working group, we can put together more of like a focus point of what we would like to see rather than six dollars. Um, you know, just blindly go out there and say just all encompassing. But let's kind of try and narrow down where we sure. see that. All right. Uh, moving on. All right, we've done that. Uh, regional Agreement Committee, uh, consensus and proposals. Mm -hmm. So we're a couple hours in the meeting. I'll try to be uh, quick on these. Um, I hope everyone's seen this in their packet. The Regional Agreement Committee put together a sort of list of consensus proposals, not something that we've all agreed on, but something that we agreed to take back to our respective committees, get the opinions of these committees. I will vote however this board feels. Uh, when I go back to the Regional Agreement Committee. So uh, the first item of discussion we have already discussed here was the requiring two-thirds vote for all school committee votes. Um, I think minimum is the right way to say it because some of the budget stuff, some things may require more than two-thirds, but um, last time we discussed it, it was roughly, a, I think it was a 3-2 vote with this board against it. Um, how do we feel now on requiring the school committee to have at least a two-thirds vote for all votes? Anybody? 
<clears throat> do you just want to go? Do you want to go down the down the list, and we'll just vote them over again, so you can? Yeah, I think that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. So right. first one is two thirds vote. All right. I, I, everyone's familiar with these. Okay, so this would be uh, the regional agreement committee. Uh, I, I guess we can call it just uh, selectman's favor. Or, yeah, uh, you, whatever the Whitman. Right, two thirds vote. I would seek a motion to that they would need a two thirds vote for all school committee votes. Meaning, if you vote yes, you want two thirds. No, you want to leave it okay. with the majority. All right. Uh, do I have a motion? Okay. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay. So, discussion. Discussion. Um, what was the feedback from the board? Did they give a general, like, they really support that and they want us to support it? Or are they split? This was probably the one that we glossed over the quickest. Um, it was proposed by Hanson's uh, selectman representative on the board. And we, at the subcommittee, we didn't really give our opinions uh, on it. It was just a, this is what the proposal is. Please take it back. Um, and we left it as is. I know, I think um, Hanson's Board of Selectmen did weigh, or Select Board did weigh in, and, and they're in favor of this. The school committee has not weighed in yet, I don't believe, Fred? We are meeting uh, two weeks, uh, and the whole purpose is the rack. Okay. So I don't know if I should even be standing here. I'm here as a private citizen, but I sort of get <clears throat> to throw my opinion yeah. out twice, I guess. Uh, Whitman pays, has 60% of the responsibility, basically. Uh, to limit to the two-thirds vote and have that uh, down in writing, I think is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Uh, I can understand Hanson wants more control, but, you know, this is the way the regions always operate. Uh, I, I think that it could be very troublesome at times to have to have a two-thirds vote. Majority should, you know, prevail. That's my if personal I, opinion. I could just, uh, my opinion is um, that, you know, a, a two-thirds vote, if we just watch the school choice vote that they had recently, um, it just has the potential to screw up a couple of votes. 90% um, of the time, it's a unanimous or near-unanimous vote. It's not going to make a difference. But the few times that it does, it's going to be, it may make it more difficult for the school committee to operate. So I think that their opinion will carry more weight, but that's just where I'm at. Uh, my, my vote will not change. I, I think I go back to the most important vote that they make regarding the town. It has to be, which is the budget, it has to be two thirds. I think this is more internal to. And how is that working out? <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> I. Uh, I guess it really. I, think, I agree. I agree with Fred. Uh, I think the majority vote is. is the way it's always been, and it's the way it, it can be, you know, no problem at all. As it was, we, and it, as it will be. That's right. <laughs> all right. I would just say that um, it's, it's, this vote isn't very important to me, to be honest. I don't have a strong opinion one way, one way or the other, to be honest. But it seems to be something that the, the board and Hanson feel strongly about, and uh, something that they've kind of stuck with. And I think this is one way, if this is one way that we can kind of recognize their concern, you know, then to me, I feel like that's a, it's an appropriate give, I guess. Um, yeah, right. I, yeah I, I kind of disagree. Um, why give it? <laughs> why, give the con why give the concern to the town of Hanson about this vote? It, it, the, <laughs> Doesn't make any doesn't make any sense to change it. We are it's a sixty four right now it's sixty forty, isn't it? Correct. Sixty forty. Sixty one thirty nine, actually. Yeah. It was and it was about that when it, when it, when they first got together in nineteen ninety one or nineteen ninety three. And it's the people in Hanson would like to have more control. They've had they've had a lot of control. For a number of years, I don't know if you look, if you if you watch the meetings, if you watch the way votes have gone, if you see who's the chairman. Usually, mm -hmm. um, I don't see I don't see a reason to. I go along with I go along with Fred. I think it's possible that it could be just disastrous at times. 
Fred the private. I understand. Fred the private citizen, not the right. school the private citizen. Private. Yeah, Fred the private. I don't want to put him in a bind when he when he gets to the meeting. Um, I agree. I, you know, I, I agree with you that the, the most important vote is the uh, is the budget, and that is two thirds. However, for the rest of it, I think it would just make it too difficult for the people that I have watched on on TV <laughs> conducting meetings to get anything done. Well, could you give an example? A specific vote. Can I give you... an example? Yeah. Um, did you watch the discussion about um, school choice the other day? Did you watch how that was that was moving? That was a very difficult discussion. Shouldn't have been that. Shouldn't have been. Shouldn't have been that difficult. They should have decided not to do school choice at all. That's what we do. Because what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing when you do? I don't want to get into an off, offbeat thing about school <laughs> choice, but it's been bugging me. For, it's been bugging me for a long time. Um, way back when, when I was a boy and I was on that school committee, we we Young man. we always we always rejected the idea of school choice because what it was doing is it was taking away, uh, it was making it more difficult for other towns to handle it handle their business when we're taking students from them. But that's only part of it. You take a student from a town that has a uh, eleven thousand per student cost. And we get five thousand, right? Where does that other six thousand go? Town keeps it. Yeah. The town the keeps it. The town yeah. keeps it. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, because the enrollment. Uh, and do you want me to come up there? Or? No, that's all right. Okay. The enrollment. Uh, I looked it up while we were at a meeting. Yeah. The enrollment stays with that district, so they get their chapter seventy funding. They get the funding um. completely. And it's just the 5000 or if uh, there are certain IEPs that are acceptable yeah. and additional expenses, they have to pay that as well. Wow, because I, I, I've never met a superintendent that, that gave me that information. Uh, I've asked them. And I they, looked it up on, online. That's I suppose how I, I ascertained it. Okay. So the town keeps the money? Yeah. That, that, the uh, so, so Abington keeps, if Abington is 11000 they keep six. And we get five. Because it's all figured into their chapter 70 yeah. and okay. that okay. pupils. You know, thank you, Fred. That, their enrollment. that clears that up, but I still don't like the idea. <laughs> it's it's, 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 right, it's still have, robbing, it's still robbing from Peter to pay for We're going to just be quick. But anyway, that that's a, that kind of discussion at a meeting I don't think would, would be um, uh, made easier if it was a two-thirds vote that, that cool. governed it. I don't know that we're shooting for easy. I think what they're looking for is more consensus, where they have a, vo a voice at the table. If it's simply 6-4 and it's Whitman, Hanson, then I think they How felt... often has that happened? Well, I think that happened, the times that it happened, maybe it, it mattered to them. And to me, I guess, like I said, I don't, have a, I don't have a strong feelings one way or the other, but they seem to. And it's a regional agreement, and if this is one way that we can kind of listen to their voice, and it's going to bring, as far as I'm concerned, if you needed seven votes on that school choice, yeah. you couldn't just get it with six. So you like li listening to their voice when they I, asked, ahead, when it. they asked for eight percent instead of five percent. Oh. All right, <laughs> right. I thought you were going to say something else. We, we, we got to <laughs> move along. Yeah. 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 It's never happened that I can recall. All right, we're moving on. So we're so, going to take a vote here on. So, on, on right. we're what's the vote? options? On the so, vote. if you uh, vote yes. You're in favor of it? You're in favor of the two-thirds vote. Okay. <clears throat> vote no, you are not in favor of it. Okay. All right. All in favor of the two-thirds vote. Not in favor. Okay. Still three to two. Still three, three, to, three two. to two. Yep. Three to two against. And I will consider the margins to whatever extent if, if they ask us to come back and discuss other things. Um, the fact that we were split probably yeah. matters. How many of these do we have again? Uh, five or six. We'll try to go quickly here. The rest of them I don't think are as um, contentious. As contentious. <laughs> so the second one, uh, roughly, the we will have to revisit this agreement every three years. Um, I think the language here is that each board shall place it on their agenda once every three years and say, yes, the agreement's still good, all set, or if one board would like to reassemble the regional agreement committee to review something we can reassemble um every three years wow every three years the thought being that board member terms are three years so that 
three years down the line, there should still be somebody who remembers what happened to the last regional uh, agreement, rather than waiting from 1991 to, to 2023. And it really, I think some of the problems that have existed may have been caught if yeah. a more mm -hmm. in-depth look was being taken. And so the, the ask for the town on this is basically um, every three years after reorganizing places on your agenda to take a look at the regional agreement. If you have any concerns, bring it back to the school committee to recall the rec. I comment on that. Why can't the superintendent of schools review the agreement, the regional agreement, and if he sees some issues, he can bring it up at one of the school committee meetings because for he, them to look at. He's not in charge of the regional agreement. The region is. The region is. Yes, and yes, but he can also look at it and make recommendations if there's issues. The schools are also held to this three-year. So it's, it's the district as well as the two towns have to review it every three years. All right. So yeah, I, I've, I've moved it. I've, I've moved it. We agree with that. All right, so we have a motion to review it every three years. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? I'll go with it. Unanimous. Okay. Uh, leases, I should have reviewed this before the meeting. Uh, it looks like... Just we'll language? This. Yeah, some language changes on the lease of towns. Um, this is the emergency section. Yeah, we struck a line out of the 2018 language for this, um, removing the committee's, the school committee's ability to make major improvements to the schools after notifying the selectmen. Um, nothing in the lease shall prevent the committee from permitting the use of the buildings uh, or premises by the town of Whitman or town of Hanson. Um, this was a, an adjustment from the 2018 language that they think better matched the original agreement. Okay, all in favor of the new language regarding the lease? I'll go with it. No, uh, we need no. a we need motion. A <clears throat> motion. Second. All in favor? Yeah, all right. See repairs. Uh, and yeah, for this, um, kind of revisiting the mold issue. So, splitting out the definition of capital cost to match what Desi considers a capital cost using the chart of accounts in the 7,000 function code, basically the things that the state lists as capital costs for school districts. Um, for elementary middle schools in each town, they will send capital items that exceed $10,000 to the towns. We currently have a different definition, but it's, re it, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then emergency repairs is pulled out as a separate item to address things like the mold. Um, Anything that's not covered by insurance equal to or greater than $10,000 that poses an immediate risk to the safety of the district students, staff, or threatens the operation of a school building or is required to comply with the law. Um, and then it's, you know, notify the towns within 72 hours of the need for an emergency repair. Member towns shall be responsible for cost and reimbursement to the district. We set that at $10,000 because that is the uh, insurance deductible that the district carries. So it seemed like a reasonable number. And it's currently at five, right? So the yes. capital cost is currently at five. The emergency repairs is new language because the regional agreement doesn't really have what to do in an emergency repair situation. So the, the current language is either you call it a special assessment, a special operating assessment to the towns, or you call it capital, and neither of those is quite the right fit. So for the sake of something like a, a water line blowing and you needing to make emergency repairs over a weekend, we're putting in emergency repair language. All right, I'll, I'll start the discussion on this one. I, this is one I, I do not particularly care for, um, <clears throat> especially given the mold situation. Uh, I personally would like to see some language in there regarding our facilities director being made aware of, of uh, these issues, getting full reporting, and being part of any emergency repair that the town actually has an access point for this, because I think we've seen the struggle with what went on with the mold issue and as far as backup and, and things like that and, and how late we were notified. Um, th these are still town buildings and I, and I think the town should have some involvement. I think all towns have facilities directors and I would like to see some language in there, not giving authority, but I, I think it would be pretty critical that 
we should have some eyes in, in the project uh, and, and maybe somebody questioning of how things got to a certain level. Because I don't think you get to just 50,000 of mold remediation <coughs> overnight. Exactly. I, I agree with Randy. Yes, I agree. So the language is currently, in the event of emergency repair, the district shall notify the appropriate member town or towns that own the building as soon as reasonably pra practical, but no later than 72 hours of having knowledge of the need for the emergency repair. Um, and during the meetings, I don't know if it was this or in a capital committee meeting, but Frank discussed the way that it typically worked was, um, you know, the superintendent would call him and say, we've got, you know, whatever issue it needs to be fixed to keep the building open. Can we spend the money? We'll send you the article for a town meeting warrant to reimburse us. And so that's the practical application of it. This is just writing it into the agreement. Okay. All right. By May, I can see an emergency situation, like a pipe freezes and breaks. Mm -hmm. But for a project that takes time to develop to become an emergency, i.e., like the mold situation, um, I got an issue with that. That, I mean, if you say emergency, yes. But something that takes time to become an emergency is not an emergency, in my opinion. It's lack of, of uh, building control, of uh, repairs to a building. I mean, mold doesn't happen overnight. You see a leak. You fix it. Yeah, I, I personally just don't like the way emergency situation is described. It's far too vague. To me, an emergency situation is you are not able to open the school the next day. Um, um, so immediate risk to the safety of the district, students, or staff, threatens operations of the building, or is required to comply with the law? I would say at the point you're at 50,000 on mold remediation, you probably were at some point risking. Yeah, there were probably students' health and, and personnel's health at risk for a long time before it got to be a $50,000 repair. Yes. I would think. So I personally would like to see prior to any repairs being made, the facility director and the town administrator will be will be made uh, will be made aware of this. Okay. Um, is there anything in the agreement that um, talks about general repairs of the building so that it doesn't reach a ten thousand dollar repair and it's charged to the town that it's on the the school's responsibility to maintain that building to keep it up. Is there anything in the regional agreement dealing with that? Um, let's see. <clears throat> well, and then it, it falls back on because the elementary and middle schools are in the towns, their town buildings, those costs are borne by the town. Over a certain amount, up to a certain amount. In other words, if, if you got a... Uh, if you have something that broke and it's going to cost a thousand dollars to repair, the school repairs it. Yeah, anything under ten thousand dollars. Anything under ten thousand, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But don't wait till that repair job goes from under ten thousand to over ten thousand, and then they say, okay, we can get it fixed now. We'll just charge the towns. That's the issue I have. And I think if we our facilities manager, if he if if he was able to go in there. And, and look at all these issues like we do. We look at a boiler if it's at its end. We don't wait till it breaks down and we have no heat in a building, in a town building like the police fire or the town hall. We get it repaired. Sooner the better, before pipes freeze or anything like that. So at, at the town buildings, and I think they need to be dealt with with a little bit more respect to the building itself. Something that sticks out in my mind that I haven't seen, which I think I've been involved in this, you know, close, coming up on nine years between the FinCom and um, th this year, I, it, it's kind of shocking to me that there are no capital requests for either school. That there's no repairs that need to be made in any school. I've, I haven't seen that since I've been part of this. They want forty thousand for the middle school in an article. To repair mold. Oh, not not, not the mold issue, but other oh. than that, it's just technology oh, oh. based. Oh, there is it's like five hundred and yeah, some odd thousand just, dollars. Yeah, so that there article. actually is no school infrastructure that <clears throat> needs to be fixed at this point, which I think differs from the capital plan. Uh, 
I'm just a private citizen, but perhaps. Uh, there used to be a matrix, uh, you know, that was distributed. Haven't seen that for a bit now. Uh, you know, so I don't know how they prioritized. Uh, you can ask the chair of that committee. Perhaps she would know. You haven't seen the matrix this year? No, there hasn't been one for a while. Uh, the chair of the committee hasn't distributed one. The matrix exists? Or you're not sure if it? It used to. It was redesigned. Uh, and actually published, I believe, yeah. is part of the, yeah, yeah. the budget book. But uh, haven't seen it. A uh, couple of quick things, if I can mention. Uh, one, on the mold issue, uh, I do know that that was a sudden thing, that uh, routinely the district does do mold tests in the air quality tests in all the buildings. So prior to that, and I would assume it wouldn't have been far more than like right around when school opened, uh, so a few months earlier, it passed the air quality test. Mm -hmm. I don't believe they knew it was leaking or seeping in where the mold was discovered. Uh, you know, so that might just be a point to take a peek at or ask the district for a copy of those reports. Uh, the other thing, I didn't hear any language about the high school. And, you know, it doesn't seem to address that for capital repairs, et cetera. So there is language. Uh, the high school is owned by the district. Therefore, capital costs for the high school shall be apportioned to member towns according to Section 5C2 above. So split by okay, cause enrollment. Because that school gets older. Yep. And then the emergency language, um, it's borne by the town or member towns. So for the, the high school, it would be split same way. You could always do what uh, they do in a service contract industry, where it just states on the contract, uh, without prior authorization, there will be no payments made for repairs. Okay, so where are we with this? We've added language. So I am adding prior to any repairs, facility director and TA should be notified. Um, and then I'm making a note of Fred's suggestion without prior authorization, no payments shall be made. But I don't know how, we, is there something that you'd like me to take back to the committee? To that. Okay. But let's, yes, this sounds good. Do we have a motion? Oh yeah, I'll move what he just said. I'll second. Thank you. All, all in favor of adding the language of uh, prior uh, mm -hmm. notice to the facilities director, town administrator, and no payment will be made without prior authorization. Yes. Okay. Moving to the next one. Okay. Um, the next one is the statutory method as is, and then eliminating the special operating cost provision. So as far as we can tell, that special operating cost provision only relates to transportation or emergency repairs. Um, where we are now defining emergency repairs, and the next thing I'm going to discuss is transportation. It's unnecessary. I don't know if anyone here can think of another special operating cost beyond those two, but... No, oh, and, and it's been made pretty clear that transportation is not a special operating cost. No. Right. So, uh, seek a motion to change the language uh, regarding special operating costs. Eliminate that, yeah. Um, All right, go ahead. I was going to make that motion. Go ahead. I make that motion. Uh, I'll second it. There you go. <laughs> All in favor? Yes. Uh, and then the last one, transportation. Um, all we included here was the, uh, as part of the annual budget process, the school committee shall determine busing requirements for the district. So changing the current, um, the current vote that they take to uh, provide non-mandated busing, but then assess the towns for non-mandated busing with just the district is in charge of deciding busing. Um, so this will put the cost, in, should put the cost back on them. So the article that we have for non-mandated busing, we don't have to fund so, anymore. And the, the RAC has not got into the details of how that'll be assessed yeah. going forward. Um, we've discussed a little bit on taking it as an operating cost so it would be split by enrollment population um, well statutory method but anything above minimum local is by enrollment um, so roughly 60 40 or um, using the same formula that we submit to the state for reimbursement that's my suggestion 
um, which would be, you know, we currently seek reimbursement per student mile traveled. Um, and I think that this, the district should assess the towns per student mile traveled because that's how they're getting the money back from the state. Um, but that's, that's my opinion. And that is not what made it into this because we are still undecided on which path to take there. Um, if this board would like to give an opinion, I can take it back to them. I have a question. Uh, Non-mandated busing. Say it's in, it's in, if we put it in their budget, mm -hmm. okay, part of the budget. Um, we do, right, and they're asking for a certain amount, bottom line figure, and we can't come up with that amount. So they say, fine, we'll take away your non-mandated busing. Then that's their decision. The school right. committee, the school and committee's in charge. the school committee's people. decision, that yeah. means some kids that normally get bus won't get bused anymore, so we're held at hostage. No. <laughs> That's why we took it out of their budget and put it in a line item originally because they, they did that. They said that when I was on the mm -hmm. FinCom. Well, you can't meet our budget. We'll just, we can't do non-mandated budget. But, but the, so way, right the way they currently have it is they're trying to have it both ways. So they take non-mandated busing out of their budget so they don't have to make that decision and then send it to the towns to, to say um, yes or no. decision to go beyond the law. But transportation should really be a decision of the school committee. Okay. Whether Who and, and whether or not to bus, at what distance from them. They make all those decisions yeah. anyway. That, and that was made very clear um, in the meeting that Desi, what I took and John was on the phone call, um, th this had to be a year and a half ago at this point. Um, they don't like the idea that a town can tell a school district <laughs> who who they bus. Who yeah. they bus. And that's and that the uh, the generation of that whole thing came that way. The town of Whitman decided because it had it had sidewalks. Sidewalks, right? It had sidewalks, uh, so kids could walk could walk to school. And but the town of Whitman wanted the children who were within certain guide certain boundaries. Like, uh, wasn't it went from two miles and we went to that two mile miles and a half? Was the high school, mile and a half, middle school, maybe, right. maybe half a mile for, for the elementary yeah. school. Just now it's a mile and a half and, and yeah, three whatever, quarters. Whatever it was, we wanted those kids to be able to be bused. So we, at a town meeting, decided to give money to the district to do that. Um, and, and so it was our money, taking care of our kids. Part of the rationale of putting it back on the school committee is that the reason that the cost of non-mandated non busing was allowed to balloon so much over the years was that they just made, a, made the assessment and sent it to the towns. If they have to cover it within their operating expenses, they will start looking for more efficiencies like changing thing. the reimbursement methodology like, like uh, Sean and, and John pushed right. last year. So by putting the emphasis back on them, they decide who to bus, when to bus them, and how to seek the reimbursement. It is a school committee decision, and really, by sending it to town meeting and giving the, each town meeting the opportunity to defeat that program of the district, right. you're running into problems with DESE. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily, we've never, no town has voted it down, but at some point, if that were to happen, I think we would have a different challenge on our hands. So actually, our, um, our, our warrant now mm -hmm. is inaccurate. Maybe cost of us. Well, because it's broke because it's broken down, and, and non-mandated busing is separate. Well, and that's how the regional agreement's written right now. Okay. So we're hoping, I, I, you know, the proposal so here is to next, change so, that. So next year it wouldn't look like that. Yeah, or the year after if it takes a year. It would to just be under the transportation line. But I will say, to Dan's point, and this comment was made by a school committee member at the last meeting. If we want to save another two hundred and eleven thousand, get rid of a non-mandated busing. Mm -hmm. So that has been put out there, and, and that is a risk you're going to run. So then there'll be some right. some, some kids that now get bused that won't be. Right. Or the district has to find the money to, to continue to provide it because they did vote to provide non-mandated busing and pass the cost to the towns. So I guess we all buy buses. It's my kids' buses in there. All right, so do you, what do you need for a vote on this? That we would accept the change in this language? So accept the change in this language, and then if there's, if there's a preference of this board on how to assess the towns for transportation, I would like to take that back. So either um, using the per student mile method that we seek reimbursement from the state, or treat all transportation as an operating expense as we currently do for mandated transportation. 
And if we do that, you're saying that the schools will get more funding? They currently get more funding. They just don't pass it along to the towns. Right. And the, the question towns is, that the students are right. busting. And the, right. And the, the extra funding that they get for the, the busing of Whitman students, does it come off Whitman's assessment? This past year, it came, not exactly, but a lot did. <laughs> a lot, <laughs> not, why not all? Because of the, uh, they, they assessed the... Because of the way that the... Yeah, John can explain Because of the way that the, it's set up as a, as a uh, cost. It has to get split 60-40. But if we go mileage method, Okay, so, so basically, just the meeting that this was set up was one of the first ones, so it was like a month and a half ago. But the concern of the, the committee, the RAC committee, was the inequity between the way Hanson students are bust and Whitman students are bust. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody in Hanson gets bust. They don't have any sidebar. They don't have, so everybody. Where in Whitman, some do, some don't. And that's an issue. Okay? So it's an equity issue. That's a big word now. Okay. okay, it's an equity issue. And then the so they wanted to eliminate, basically, you know, make it so that the whole responsibility comes back to the school committee, and they will do it in a way that is the same for all the towns. Okay, so answering that, doing it that way, more kids in Whitman are bust than kids in Hanson. True. That is correct. Okay. Um, not, Bottom line no, figure. Actually, no, not necessarily. Personnel wise, it is. People wise, it is. People wise it is. Miles wise, it isn't. And, okay. and there are more walkers in Whitman than Hanson. Yeah. Well, my question is, is right. My question is, if you have one budget for transportation, and more of that budget is put towards is because of Whitman, right? And they get more funding reimbursement for Whitman. Hanson's getting forty percent of Whitman's. If you do it the way it's currently done, that is correct. Now, the thought process in doing it, the mileage method, was to make it make the equity the same. So basically, if they are getting reimbursed for miles by the DESI, which is they are, yeah. they are, they've they've calculated it all. They know exactly how many miles each, non-mandated, mandated, all that. From the town standpoint, we're eliminating the non-mandated line. It's transportation only, and it will become an operating cost. So it's done. It's no longer mandated and non-mandated. But it's we're just, not getting full credit for our oh, busing. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if you do it via the mileage method, which is the way that they're getting it reimbursed, yeah. then you take all of the Whitman miles and you, you take the total transportation cost, you get the per mile it costs. However many miles go to Whitman, that's the amount that Whitman gets assessed. Okay. However many miles go to Hanson, that's what Hanson gets assessed. Now, the way you look at it, Hanson is actually about 53% of the miles to Whitman's 47%. So it would flip-flop the assessment based on doing it the mileage method. But if Whitman decided that we didn't want to bus all of our non-mandated, we could tell them that. Okay? But... The thing is, is that, and I've said this before, I think Desi's going to have a problem with us getting, with the district getting reimbursed the mileage method and assessing it, and I think that's what Randy said earlier, and assessing it a different way. They made that pretty clear that you really shouldn't be doing that. You should look at doing it. And I think the committee was pretty much, the RAC committee was pretty much for the, doing it the mileage method, although they haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where they're at. Mr. Kang, be quick. <clears throat> I think we should do the most precise way to, to calculate it. And I think the most pr precise way to do it is to calculate the mileage method as being done in, in Whitman and Hanson for total transportation. That's what's the most precise. Mm -hmm. and I and, think that's and, how it should be done. And, and we've also seen better results with that now being done with the <laughs> data lesson. Um, as far as the reimbursement goes, Dan, we've seen significant savings over the last two years because they went to the mileage method. Uh, and last year, the current fiscal 23 and next year, the transportation numbers have gone down significantly because they're getting more reimbursement from the state. And so right now, is it getting, it's getting split 
So we're not seeing as much as we should, but we've still seen significant savings, even all the way through non-mandated busing, too. And if it doesn't work, we can change it in three years, right? Yeah, you right. can revisit in three years. And, and actually, <laughs> what, I, what I brought up at the last meeting was there's currently two formulas that the district uses to assess transportation. And the way they've selected to do each, the mandated they do by, um, by student population, 60-40, and the non-mandated they do by mileage, both of those disadvantage Whitman. We ha if we pick one or the other, Whitman will benefit. But because we're splitting it and assessing it two different ways, because of the way the regional agreement is written, that's, the way we're, that's why we're doing it this way, um, both of them cost us a little bit more. Is it true that, it's true that we gave, what, $200,000 last year in man non-mandated busing? This year, it will. What was last, last year was? 216.05 okay. guide, 216. Okay. Two hundred, two hundred thousand um, dollars. But the schools got reimbursed for that, is what I'm hearing. No, not, not, for not, the not, non not they didn't. Right. So that that cost, that's a very that, specific that. cost outside of any reimbursement. Okay. But but the year before, you'll remember it was four hundred and change. change. Yeah. That's the so difference that they got reimbursed for. It got cut in half. Okay. By switching the methods. And we got more reimbursement. But the reimbursement <coughs> you're talking about, no one ever saw that back. Yeah, yeah. Can you where, did, right, where did that money go? I asked that question in a meeting, and it was waiting to be certified into uh, E and D at the time. Now it's in E and D. Uh, perhaps uh, one of you folks want to send an email to the district and ask them where that money is. Our money, <laughs> basically. All right. Money that we already paid. Private citizen Fred says. Money that we already paid. Really? <laughs> All right. Cir circling back. So, so a motion. Motion to use the uh, recommend using the mileage method for transportation. Uh, and include the new language mm -hmm. as part of the budget. Include the new language as part of the budget. I would seek a motion. It's so moved. Somebody else made the second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. I'll go with it. Okay. We we'll, we'll got three years to change it. Uh, and <laughs> that is it. Yeah. Okay. Where's Thank one? you. Uh, that was the last. Uh... Really? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have a question on the original <coughs> agreement. One item as a treasurer that I was always concerned about is when we pay our assessments. Uh, three out of the four quarters fall on a real estate bill due date when we have the influx of cash from the tax service companies. The fourth um, installment is due in April, April 1st, and we don't get the cash flow in until the due date of May 1st. So that is one thing that I did mention, and I'm hoping that we can still Yeah, I brought that up at, that. at one of the meetings. It seemed like a non-controversial issue. We just, um, I think the committee asked for clarification from both Whitman and Hanson on what kind of a schedule would be best. So whether it's a 30, 30, 30, 10, do more of an upfront payment or just match the tax. Just payments. match the tax. That's just move April to May. As simple as that. And okay. that's when the cash and I think flow That's what was they best. did in the 2018 um, agreement that was never voted. Okay. So I'm hoping that we could get that changed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that it? Thank you. No yes. problem. All right. New business. Seek a motion uh, act to rescind the appointment of Fred Gilmade, Gilmetti from the position of delegate Old Colony Planning Council. I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. With, with regret. Uh, <clears throat> act to appoint Noreen O'Toole to the position of delegate Old Colony Planning Council for the remainder of a one year term through June 30th, 2023, in order to fill an existing vacancy. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Yes. Act on the resignation of John Galvin from the position of member of the DPW <coughs> Building Committee, effective March 9, 2023. So moved. With, with regret. Right. Um, they want to accommodate your schedule a little bit more, or they can't move it a little bit later? Is that what? Uh, what's the reason for the resignation? <laughs> <laughs> Big loss, you know that. I haven't been able to make the meetings. Wednesday is a terrible day for me. It's my busiest day of my work schedule right in the middle of the day and 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 it's kind of settled in you know i mean i've missed four out of the last five meetings i'm not really making it uh, have you talked to kevin excuse me i didn't mean uh, talk about maybe changing the date it's, it's not up to me to have i mean this kind of settled in on a date 
and everybody's kind of good with it, so it's not up to me to have put everybody else out just so that I can make the meetings. I mean, question: If if it's brought up tomorrow night and I'm, we have a meeting tomorrow night, uh, would you object? Well, the only day I could probably make it is Mondays, maybe, but I, I'd still would stand by my resignation. It's just, you know, it would have to be like seven o'clock at night for me to. Well, it's a big loss because you are very right. good at that meeting. Right. I thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. We have a motion, I believe. Right, and we have a second. With regret, all in favor? Aye. Okay, act on the request of Michael Ganshard on behalf of Whitman Hinton Hanson Dollars for Scholars to declare April as Dollars for Scholars Month. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Act on the request of Michael Ganshard on behalf of the Whitman enhance and dollars for scholars to erect the fundraising thermometer on the town hall lawn from April through the end of May. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Next item on the agenda. Um, as you all know, um, Mr. John Campbell has uh, probably would say probably made it part of his life's work to yeah. to collect the history of this town. Um, and uh, we do know that he needs to be out of his uh, business in a relatively short time period. I don't know if we know exactly when that is. Not a, he, I think 30 days a month. Uh, I've, I want to say he said, did he say June? Yeah, end of May. End of May, end of May. End of May yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, although right now, I think we've... You know, we have the Historical Society, we have the Hist Historical Commission. The Historical Society is in control. That, that is John Campbell's right. property. Um, I think at, at a bare minimum, the town needs to at least provide some type of safe storage to preserve this while we are looking for a site. Um, I believe, Dr. Kowalski, you, you were able to attend I, I was able to attend a meeting last week of the Historical Society that John called, uh, and the major topic of discussion was wh where to store, have, yeah. where to put, uh, not to not to store the stuff, but where to open up a museum. Uh -huh. uh, any any plan that uh, that I heard that night was going to take a long time. Would have taken a long time to accomplish, and probably a lot of money at a time when money is scarce. I thought, I thought that the, the least we could do for John, for all that he has done, is to take the burden of storing that material that he has, and it's rooms of material, storing that material someplace safe so that he doesn't have to rent a, a storage bin for his backyard, <laughs> which is what he might, might have had to do. So we um, looked at a few um, uh, alternatives. Um, the two major ones were the, the police station, um, and the other was the, uh, was there any room in the armory? And uh, John and Mary Beth mm -hmm. and Chief uh, met at the armory uh, the other night, and um, John, John thinks that the armory is the best place to put it, and it's available. I think we should um, help them all we can to get the stuff from where it is now to there, and at least it'll be in a safe place while we figure out what to do. Or what, how, uh, while the Historical Society figures out what to do, maybe raises money to, to do something to establish a, 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 a museum. It's not the Historical Commission, again, it's the Historical Society. Say, yeah. So, and I, and, and I think he's, um, he's happy with that, um, with that arrangement. And I think we have a, I mean, an obligation to make sure that this stuff is preserved. Mm -hmm. So, and I especially believe, especially that dinosaur's head, right. the dragon's head, yep. yes, right. from, and, from and, King's and Castle. The, and the police, uh, from King's Castle land. The police thing that there was in the center of town for yeah. years in the yeah. '60s and '70s. So. And um, and he's gonna find a way to pack it up, and we, I believe, we have. Yep. Somebody is going to... Yeah, and I, I think the DVW is going to be able to help him move it, right? That yeah. was mentioned the other day that they would ask the DVW yeah. and so, everybody would see what they could do to help. Yeah. 
If you need an extra truck, I'll donate and drive. Yep. I'll lift what I can. Yeah. All right, so we would be, uh, I can seek a motion to extend the, the offer of using the, the armory uh, for the Historical Society Museum storage until uh, a permanent arrangement can be made. Why don't you make that motion? I'll sir. make the motion. And I will second it. Any further discussion? Just thank you for doing that. And to do everything that we can to help them help them move. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I'm going to skip over uh, or uh, entertain a motion to table recorded meetings and, and that. And, uh, okay. Until Mr. Lynham, I think he wanted to speak on that. I'll make a motion to uh, pass to table it. To table for. He, he wanted to speak on that, correct? He was going to speak, but... I'll make a motion to table well, Unless you want to. Do you want to table it? No, I think he was going to prepare okay. for it, so... Okay. So we'll table that to the next meeting. Uh, set April meeting schedule. Uh, and then we get town meeting coming up, too, so... I know. Fourth and the 18th. With that, I think we should probably that also hopefully if the school committee meets on the 29th. Maybe there's some different things to talk about, but I, I also believe we're, we're going to have to probably vote. The warrant that night? The 4th? On the 18th or the 4th? I think we'd have to vote the warrant by the... F we would have to sign and post by the by the 24th, but really the 18th. So the 18th, we could do it the 18th. I, I, I'm i not available on the 4th. Okay. You would be on I the... I would be available on the 18th. Maybe the 11th and 18th, just to see as the school budget changes. You want to do back to back, back, to back weeks? Pardon? I'm sorry. The 11th and the 18th? Or? Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm not here on the 11th either. Okay. The 18th is the first one I'm available. 18th and 25th? Well, uh, I'm just wondering if that's getting... Uh, too close? Too late. It is. Um, so let's do the 4th and the 18th. Does that work, Reverend? I'm not available on the 4th. Okay. Let's do the 11th and the 18th. Yeah. That's a good idea. All right. Does that work for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Chair, uh, just for a point of reference, uh, the 12th of April, the school committee is supposed to be getting together for our regular meeting, and I would anticipate the budget being a topic of discussion, just as I, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm, my main concern is it's second week, of, you know, if we don't meet till the 11th, it's not an awful lot of time to, mm -hmm. to try and work things out. In we don't know when the schools are going to meet to fight with the Finance Committee, do we? Uh, next Tuesday now. Is it? I believe the superintendent called. Okay. The fourth and the eleventh. We can do the fourth without Mary Beth. The eleventh and the eighteenth. We don't have the fourth. I think. Carl's. Oh, Carl's not here either. I got the eleventh. I got the eleventh and eighteenth. So the eleventh and eighteenth. We doing? Okay. Eleventh and eighteenth. Yeah. That works for me, but the fourth, you're not available. The fourth, no. are you? Okay. You're not available. I'm yeah. available only on the eighteenth. You'll be available the eighteenth. Yep. All right. We'll go the eleventh and the eighteenth. And, and depending any results, uh, we, we may have to meet the 25th as well, but we can play that one by ear. Mm -hmm. All right? We're going to meet the, an hour before town meeting or half an hour before town meeting, too? The first? Probably. Yeah, but... Probably, yeah, but that's nothing. We'll leave the 25th open for 11th and the 18th confirmed. 
and then we would have the 25th if we had to. I'm good that day too, yeah? All right. For the team meeting, yeah. Okay. I think that has exhausted except for the town administrator's report. Okay. The only thing I have is Boston 25 News, the zip trip to Whitman. Yes. Um, they've reached out to us. We did that one other time years ago. Um, I, I set that up. You did? Uh, when uh, Town Hall was 100, it was uh, reached 100 years old. Okay. And Brian and I, we, we did that and we set it up and that's the first time I met VB or Doug Goody and mm -hmm. he doesn't work for me anymore at all. So they would like to uh, come out to Whitman. It's their 20th season doing the zip trips and um, they're looking at a tentative date of Friday, August 11th in the town park. If you're amenable to that, I can get back to them and, and start the process. They said they had several viewers uh, that reached out to them and said Whitman would be a, a good town to visit, so. How many of those viewers were Dan? Huh? <laughs> well, that'll be Friday, August 11th. Friday, August 11th. Okay. Let the DPW know they cleaned the park right up. Okay, <laughs> I will let them know. <laughs> okay, I don't think you need that. Well, I don't think you need a vote on that. To, well, no. well, do you need a vote? I don't think we need a vote. I just wanted to let you know, make yeah. sure it's okay that I move ahead with that date. All right. Okay, then that's that was it. it. That was it. All right. So, <laughs> finally, uh, seeing that it has exhausted our agenda, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you.